Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. I've been lurking around your podcast long enough that I thought this story might be of interest to some people. I promise this is all genuine. I've done my best to limit embellishments and tell everything factually. This did happen 10 years ago so I'm a little fuzzy on some of the details but I've noted that were necessary. So when I was 15, way back in 2006, my best friend Michelle, her parents, James and Laura, and some family friends, Janet and Trevor, invited my friend Emma and I to spend a week with them at this place called Grindel's Hut. Grindel's Hut is a cottage in the middle of the Volcathunya Gammon Ranges National Park about 7 hours drive from Adelaide the capital city of South Australia. It's actually a cottage next to a tiny hut built by stockman John Grindle back in the early 1900s, more on him later. Her family had stayed there a few times and said it was absolutely stunning. One place they were really keen to revisit was Bunyip Chasm, the photos I've seen look amazing. Unusually colored rocks, ferns and waterfalls all around this narrow chasm deep in the bushland. Again more on that later. That far north it's all dirt roads, we were driving a 4WD station wagon, rugged car but didn't have much clearance. While Janet and Trevor drove a Land Rover which was far more ideal for the terrain. It was the middle of winter so heavy rains had turned large sections of road into muddy slip and slides and a few creeks along the way had flooded covering the roads. We managed to get as far as Ego Warda this brilliant aboriginal cultural center campsite run by the Adnyamatana people. The park ranger came through and said the road ahead was almost unpassable and they had to close it for safety, so we decided to rent a couple of cabins at Ego Warda and wait for the roads to dry up. I'm so glad we did because it was honestly one of the best experiences of my life. During the day we went on bush walks to cave painting sites and at night there'd be a big bonfire where we'd sing songs and hear traditional stories. Some of it was a bit trying though, on the first night a bus full of aboriginal foster kids rocked up. We were told by their teachers, carers that they were all problem children who had been in the foster system for a while, constantly being handed on by families who couldn't handle them. We did feel really sorry for them, they'd clearly had hard lives but in all honesty for the most part they were horrid little shits. These kids were all 7 to 12 years old, constantly screaming, fighting and using swear words I'd never consider using even now and they were not afraid of anyone. They completely vandalized the public areas of the campsite, trashed the games room and broke the latticing off of a rotunda. The camp staff were surprisingly cool about it, I expected them to go ballistic. They sat all the kids down and told them off obviously but the kids just laughed. However despite being little hooligans they did still have an appreciation for country and aboriginal culture. One of the stories were learned around the campfire that first night was about an evil spirit man, he. It had a name but I have no idea how to spell it. We all learned about him in a fun little song written by one of the elders. The lyrics were about walking home at night and having the spirit man following you so you start running away or he'll curse you. Typing that out it's actually super creepy but somehow the song was still fun and a bit silly. That first night none of us got much sleep because the kids were all up screaming and carrying on but the next day they got taken out on a private bush walk with some of the elders and they came far more solemn, I was taken aback. They told us that they'd learnt secret things they couldn't tell us white fellas and all of a sudden they didn't think the evil spirit man was so funny anymore. That night they were all quite well behaved. A few tried staying up late and being silly but the rest would shush them up saying the spirit man would come. They seemed genuinely afraid. The change in their behavior was so noticeable I started to get a little worried myself. One of the Adnyamatana people's most important stories is about the rainbow serpent Akura who is responsible for creating the land and animals. The story talks about how Akura came down from the ranges to drink all the water in Lake Froome before returning to rest in Bunyip Chasm. This was really interesting to us because Bunyip Chasm was on the top of our list of places to visit. 
Now as most people would know the Aboriginal people are deeply connected to their country and there are often many sacred places that need to be respected or treated with care. For the Adnumatana people Bunyip Chasm is one of the them. I'm ashamed to say I don't know the traditional name for the site. We ended up spending three days at Iga Warda. When we left we mentioned that we wanted to visit Bunyip Chasm and the staff got a little funny about it. Again it's a sacred site and they take that seriously as we should have too. They advised us not to go there but if we did to be careful. Honestly the more I think about it the more frustrated I am that we didn't listen. We're all very open-minded people, Michelle's parents border on being hippies so we greatly respect Aboriginal culture, but obviously not enough to stop us going to one of their scared places. Anyway on we traveled to our original destination Grindel's Hut. Now Grindel's Hut is the most remote place I have ever been to in my life, there is nothing out there but endless bushland. I honestly can't describe it in a way that isn't wanky but there is just something about such ancient untouched Australian bushland that is deeply moving. It feels so empty but also so incredibly full of life and energy it can honestly be a little overwhelming if you open yourself up to it. I nearly had a panic attack when I spent too long thinking about how far away from anything we were. The only building nearby is the ranger station, we stopped in there to collect the key and register ourselves. You have to let them know where you're going, what you're doing and when you'll return in case something happens and they have to come find you. Again we mentioned we plan to go to Bunyip Chasm. Apparently when Michelle's family had last been through it was fairly well advertised as a popular hiking trail or place of interest but we saw almost nothing about it on our way up. The ranger said they decided to stop advertising it because there had been quite a few accidents. Obviously curious we asked her more about it. Just a few more background details here to help paint the picture. The chasm is a few kilometers up from Grindel's hut. To get there you drive your car to the end of a dirt track to a place called Loch Ness Well, Spoopy. Then you have to walk about three hours up a gorge through the creek bed until you finally reach a dead end with only a narrow path through. This is the beginning of the chasm. I 5 you used to be able to just walk in but now there was a big boulder blocking the entrance. Apparently this doesn't deter people and most of them managed to climb over the boulder and get in. So obviously when scrambling over rocks is involved there are going to be some injuries. First there were a few sprains, a cracked wrist here and there, then a broken leg that required the rangers to go in and carry the person out. I vaguely recall hearing about a death at some point but I'm reluctant to say that's a fact. Because of all these injuries they decided to try and make it safer by putting proper ladders in. Two tradies went in and while they were drilling holes to install the ladder one of them slipped and cracked his skull. That was when it was decided it wasn't worth the risk and they stopped advertising it, the ladder was never installed. Michelle's parents are highly optimistic people so they only found all this curious while my friends and I were quietly apprehensive. Echoing the staff at Iga Warda, the ranger recommended that we not go there at all but if we did to be careful. The main access to Grindel's hut is via A4 WD track around the gorge that surrounds it but it hadn't been graded recently and since the wagon didn't have enough clearance to make it through we left it at the ranger's station, loaded all our supplies into the Land Rover and Janet and Trevor drove in while we made the 11 kilometer, approx, trek through the gorge. Just even more evidence as to how extremely isolated this place is. We finally make it to the cottage when the rains come in again. After all the hiking we were glad to just stay indoors and read for a day or two. So this was when we learnt the unsettling backstory of the location. So as I said the cottage you stay in is built in front of the original hut, which is horribly dilapidated and super creepy now, built by cattle farmer John Grindle in 1918. Several mysterious incidences had occurred there, I can't remember the full story but roughly John's cattle began disappearing. His mule was killed then one of the men he hired to help him muster the cattle one year went missing and was found to be murdered. Grindle was convicted and jailed but spared hanging. Apparently Grindle's ghost has been seen around the old hut, which having seen the hut I do not doubt in the slightest. But aside from getting the creeps from the old hut I never experienced anything personally. By the time the rain cleared up and we finally set out for the chasm I was more creeped out by the hut than all the warnings we'd been given. The walk up the creek bed was beautiful, 
The rains meant it was flowing in most places so we had to rock hop for a fair bit of it which was fun. There were frogs, birds and kangaroos about, absolutely ideal hike. About halfway along we came across another group, they were staying at the campsite back near the ranger station and had driven in specifically to visit the chasm. Despite it not being heavily advertised the chasm is still quite well known via word of mouth. We stopped and chatted to them for a bit and they told us they didn't end up making it to the chasm because their youngest boy started feeling ill and they decided to turn back. We wished them the best and carried on. After that the hike started feeling. Different. It was probably a combination of the ever-growing cliffs looming over us and the warnings creeping back into my mind but I no longer felt welcome. Now I know it's just a feeling but being welcome to a place is very important in aboriginal culture otherwise you can upset the spirits who will play tricks on you or try to hurt you. We were almost at the end of the creek bed, about 500 meters away from the chasm when Trevor, the family friend slipped on the rocks and twisted his back. It wasn't too bad he could continue on but being an older man and that far away from help it was a bit of a worry. Trevor's injury slowed our pace a little but we finally made it to the opening of the chasm. The opening was around 2 meters wide and exactly as the ranger described right in the middle was a large boulder about 3 meters tall. It was much bigger than I expected and completely smooth, nothing really to grab on to. Making it even more inaccessible was the large dirty pond at the base of it. Despite the recent rain it didn't look like fresh water, it had that dark brown color and had obviously been sitting stagnant for a while. Leaning across the pond against one side of the boulder was a decent sized log. Someone had clearly put it there to use as a kind of ramp to help climb over. Michelle's dad was the first to try, the log looked worn and was slightly damp from yesterday's rain. He slipped slightly and almost got to the top when it cracked and he fell into the pond. The pond is full of rocks so he got pretty badly bruised. The log crumbled down next to him. By this point I was certain we were not supposed to get into the chasm the place basically had a do not enter sign on it, something didn't want us there but the adults were determined. We'd come this far. We looked all around for different options to help us in, more rocks, another log but there was absolutely nothing. Finally Michelle's dad gave her mum a boost up onto the boulder. She's a tall lady and only just made it up. From on top of the boulder she sighed, apparently there must have been a rock slide and the inside of the chasm had filled with rock debris making it very difficult to get through. It was decided that even if we all managed to get over the boulder it wasn't safe to continue on, especially with Trevor's back and Michelle's dad now bruised and soaking wet. I was slightly disappointed but also quietly relieved. The mood had completely changed. Everyone was a little sullen and with the sun beginning to set the gorge seemed gloomy and foreboding. Coupled with the unwelcome feeling I think we were all ready to head back. Then not 300 meters from the chasm Emma suddenly tripped and sprained her ankle. I couldn't believe it, we had been warned that there had been accidents but we didn't even get into the chasm and we had already had three ourselves. Emma is prone to the dramatic so I thought she was hamming it up but it turned out she was actually quite hurt and couldn't walk unsupported. The car was 3 hours away and it was getting late, so our only option was to take turns supporting her as we walked out. The walk back was grim, you know that feeling like someone is standing right behind you? It felt like that for the longest time. Michelle and I started singing to entertain ourselves, mainly Disney songs because we're dorks, and that really seemed to change the mood. It was probably just a mentality thing but the general feel of the gorge seemed to lift a little, maybe whatever forces were around respond well to singing? I don't know. When we got back to the cars was almost sunset and the wind had picked up. That was our last night at the cottage and probably also the creepiest. The wind didn't let up all night, whistling around the cottage. Trevor almost had an asthma attack. He'd left his medication at home but luckily I had an inhaler with me. He kept, thanking me the rest of the trip, a potential attack in the middle of nowhere is pretty freaking scary I guess. The next morning we packed up. Emma's ankle was still buggered but since we had eaten most of the food we'd brought in we managed to create a space for her in the Land Rover so she didn't have to walk out. Michelle, her parents and I set off back through the gorge to the ranger's station. 
After a week of hiking and exploring we were pretty done so everyone was fairly quiet on the walk home. Michelle and I being younger and slightly fitter ended up a little way ahead of her parents. We had just reached the top of a small hill at one end of the gorge when something made one of the weirdest sounds I've ever heard. Now Australian animals make weird noises, cockatoos sound like bloody pterodactyls but we're all outdoorsy nature people so we know most animal noises when we hear them. The closest sound I can match it to is a camel's bellow but with a small shriek at the end. There are feral camels in Australia but they're mainly up north. It could have been a feral goat but we had goats at school and it didn't sound like that. It was quite loud and echoed down the gorge so it stopped us in our tracks. We looked around for a sign of whatever had made the noise but we saw nothing. We ran back to Michelle's parents and they'd heard it too. They agreed it was weird and couldn't say what might have made it but being as chilled as ever they weren't really fussed about it. It was so odd, just one single cry like someone yelling and stay out. Before slamming the door on you. That was an amazing trip, I learned and experienced so much. But the biggest thing I took away from it was to always respect indigenous culture. I'm not at all religious and only vaguely spiritual but I completely believe that the aboriginals are connected to the land on a level we will never understand. They know things and if they say not to go somewhere, it's in your best interest to listen. I'm currently a ranger, and before this, I had another job at a different park that I will probably never step foot in again after what I experienced there last year. For the record, it's very busy during the day, I got a lot of visitors and did a lot of walkthroughs and tours. My favorite part about the job was that everybody left at night. I would have the park all to myself as I was the only one working that shift. I love nature, and I'm happiest when I'm outside, so this was the perfect job for me. One day, an older lady came in and asked for a tour. She was by far the nicest person I'd met, and she seemed to enjoy my company for some reason. She stalled the tour as much as she could, calling me a child the entire time when saying something or making a statement or asking a question that seemed sweet to me. She was just so sincere, and to share my same passion was wonderful. She later told me that she realized we pretty much felt the same way about nature and even had a very similar connection. I felt something warm about this lady that I could not really describe, but I didn't mind spending the entire day showing her around. As it got darker, she began to get sad, and I asked her about it. She told me that she was sad about her time with me passing, and I told her she could come here anytime if she wanted to talk. She thanked me and said that she hoped she would have a chance to come again. In her voice and eyes, I saw that somehow she believed she would never see me again after that night. It was overall sad, and I wondered if she had a disease or something and was dying, but I thought it rude to ask, so I didn't. She said she wanted to show me something and took me to the last part of the park, where there was this beautiful fountain. She told me how the fountain was made of marble and it was probably the most beautiful fountain that would ever be built because it was built by her grandfather, whom she loved very much. When she was a little girl, she would often come to the edge and look at the water, imagining what her life would end up like, but she never hoped it would turn out like it did. She was very calm and seemed like she was at peace with everything around her and inside of her. I couldn't believe somebody could be that peaceful. Although I told her I would be happy if she came around here more often, the sadness in her eyes remained. She took my face in her hands and told me she was proud of me, that it turned out just the way she could have hoped. That kind of confused me, but I didn't want to ask. She said it was time to say goodbye. I went behind the fountain to follow her to see where she was going, but nobody was there. Now, I was weirded out because I didn't know where this old lady had disappeared to. I asked the guy at the reception if an older lady with her description had left, and he said no, no older women had come in today at all. The whole thing was extremely weird, but I ignored it and went on with my day. Now, fast forward two months later, I was looking through my mom's photo album, and I saw a picture of the old lady. I was shocked and asked my mother who that was. What she told me made me question my reality and my memory to this day. She said that she was my great-grandmother. I still believe that something unexplainable happened to me. 
The next day, I quit my job. If I ever saw that fountain again, I would ask about it, and I'm too afraid to find out if what that woman told me is true. It was 2009-ish. I was living on the road for two years, hitchhiking and riding trains. I was a dumb 18 to 19 year old. I had been all over the country, west coast multiple times, southwest and decided to see the east coast. Went to Florida and went to a small festival there. It's called a rainbow gathering, they're kind of like big meetups of traveler kids, old hippies, tramps, those kinds of people. They're always in state parks or national parks. Rangers will patrol it and police sometimes show up but for some reason it's allowed. Not sure how but these have been going on since the 70s I think. Some people who show up are hardcore train hopper gutter punk types and some are super chill Christians who will wash your feet. It's a very unusual festival. There are smaller regional gatherings and a big national gathering where thousands of people show up. Kind of the poor man's burning man. Huge fire pits get dug out, elaborate latrines, hundreds of drum circles, free food is constantly made from kitchens which are just camps devoted to making food for all us bums. Well I met some friends at a smaller regional one in Florida and we parted ways never thinking I was going to see them again. One was named Anna and we sort of hit it off. I hitchhiked north all the way to upstate New York when I caught wind of the national gathering which was going to be in Pennsylvania. I figured I might as well go. I got to this gathering early, in the Allegheny National Park, and helped set up, trying to meet people, kind of looking for my group, not sure where I was going to be camping. One day I ran into Anna who I had met in Florida. Me and her had some spiritual conversations in Florida, talking about fairies and UFOs. She had some unusual stuff happen to her when she was a kid. So she and her buddy had just gotten to PA and we decided the three of us were going to team up. We noticed a ton of people showing up to this thing, it was getting really crowded so we decided to move camp to a more remote area. We chose a spot off of the main trail which goes from the parking lot to the gathering. It's a couple miles long and there's a lot of foot traffic going up and down, people going in and out of the festival but we had some space. This happened around dusk, me and Anna were sitting by our little twig fire, stone cold sober, alcohol isn't really allowed at a gathering, it does still get in but there's a camp at the parking lot called A Camp where all the drinkers stay. There's of course other drugs at these festivals but me and Anna and her friend just weren't into the whole drum circle scene. We had just gotten done having a deep talk about spirituality when we started to feel hungry and stood up to start heading down to the main circle, which is where everyone can get one big meal a day. We're standing up when Anna says hey do you hear that and I said no, and just kept putting out the fire with my foot and she was like no hey, shh, listen so I stopped and I could hear the sound of someone walking through the forest. The thing that was weird about it was that it was coming from a direction where there was no festival. So the festival was down below us about a half mile if we were looking down the trail and this sound was coming from our left where it's just hundreds of miles of Pennsylvania woods. The parking lot is way up the trail a few miles behind us. It was odd because it sounded like a person speed walking towards us. I didn't think dear because they wouldn't be coming up to a fire pit, I genuinely thought it was just some lost hippie. As this sound was getting closer there were some people walking down the trail and some walking up the trail. There's a weird custom called Nick at night. If you yell Nick at night a dude with a tin can full of tobacco will come find you and roll you a cigarette. There's about 10 of them walking around and their sole job is to maintain everyone's nicotine habit. They get a ton of donations from A camp. So anyways these two groups run into a Nick at night kid and now are all standing together on the main trail talking about 10 meters below us, oblivious to us. So while that's happening to our right and below us, this sound of someone walking from our left has gotten so close that we should be seeing who or what it was and there just wasn't anything there. I was frozen, kind of stuck in a state of confusion and I think Anna was too. No fear, just why aren't we seeing it? We could visibly see leaves and dirt being kicked up, like there was an invisible person power walking by. Whatever it was, it went right up to that group of people on the main trail and didn't stop, 
but it slowed down like it was checking them out. They were totally oblivious to this. They were all smoking, talking and laughing. It kind of did a turn as it went up to them and then suddenly did a straight line towards me and Anna. Anna had a keychain with a million things on it and she was frantically looking for this mini flashlight she had on it. It was dusk so not bright out, but still light enough we could see the footfalls and debris being kicked up. My mind was thinking there's a squirrel or a field mouse, hopping on the forest floor or something. The forest floor was covered in dead leaves but these steps were quick, as if this was a child or a small person walking fast. It's hard to explain with writing. This thing came right up to us. I'm standing to the right of our smoldering fire and Anna to the left. I could hear her just struggling with this keychain. It came right up to me, probably five or six feet away. There was nothing there. It did the same thing with the group, it slowed its pace like it was checking us out, like a slow trot. As it went by Anna said hey and shone the light where it was, nothing to see, and whatever this thing was took off up the hill. Just absolutely took off, it was so fast. The footfalls became like a machine gun. If I had wanted to run after it I couldn't have. A second later me and Anna took off running the opposite direction, past that group and just kept going till we were at the bottom. Funny thing happened, there's people at these gatherings who spend the whole month naked, they'll roll around in mud and just look like mud people for the whole festival. One of these people we had seen around was this 7 foot giant of a man, probably 400 pounds, naked, covered in mud and leaves. Me and Anna are in full flight mode and at this point it's dark and we run right into this guy, scared us so bad, Anna screamed and we all started laughing and that sort of cancelled out the panic. We went to go find our other friend and it was weird because Anna was very scared, she kept saying it was because of her, like she had a weird fairy, alien situation happened to her as a kid with her mom and she felt like whatever this was, was because of her. I don't know but she did not want to talk about it after and I could never get her to elaborate. Me and this other friend, we were all about it, we went back up there, Anna said she wasn't going and wanted us to pack up the tent, and we sort of hung out, tried to look for tracks with our lights, listened, nothing happened. I've gone from thinking it was an alien, like a grey, to a ghost. Or maybe a fairy or a gnome. One person said it could have been a pukwudgie. These are like Native American gnome things that are tricksters and can turn invisible. They are supposed to be in that area. So I don't know. I'm a patrol officer in North Central New Mexico. My partner and I park our patrol vehicles at the bottom of a long dirt road that leads to an abandoned school. We only do this on the night shift when it starts to get slow around 1 am it's a relatively safe place for us to catch up on paperwork. We have had several odd experiences there, from strange lights that maneuver quickly in the woods, to possible UFO sightings. We even found a body down there years ago that still has not been identified. But that's not even the most terrifying. This was in October of 2020 at around 2 am it was a dead night, and crime was low that time of year partly because of C-19 and partly because it was cold. We had parked our vehicles side by side, facing opposite directions so that the driver's side windows lined up. This is common in our line of work. My partner gets dispatched to a noise complaint and leaves. I use this time to step out and relieve my bladder. As I'm standing outside I hear a whistle in the woods across the abandoned school grounds. These woods are roughly 100 yards from where I am parked. The whistle was a tune like it came from a human mouth, and it was oddly loud. We do have a homeless problem in my town, but not in the area I patrol. I assume a homeless person who must have wandered their way to the south side of the town. I get back in my car and roll my window up, anxiously awaiting my partner's return. My partner returns after about 20 minutes. I tell him the story and we move on to other topics. I'm a believer in the paranormal, but he is a skeptic. Within about 30 minutes, he decides that he needs to relieve himself. So he steps out and walks to the rear of his patrol car. He's back there for roughly 5 seconds, and boom, we hear it again. A loud whistle to the tune of a slow song. The whistle lasts for maybe 10 seconds. 
He walks back to my window and his face is a pale milky white. So, as cops do, we decided to investigate. We grab our flashlights and start walking slowly through the field. That grass is up to our waist. We get to about halfway in the field when we hear it again, but this time it sounds like it's coming from our right side, where the school is. As we are standing there with our flashlights shining on the school, we begin to see the grass start to move. There is no wind, and the grass is not moving around us. It looks like something is crawling in the field. The grass is moving slowly, in a straight path towards us. We begin walking towards the movement. At this point, we both have our hands on our firearms. The air is eerily still, and you could see our breath from the cold. I can tell that my partner is uneasy. We are walking very slowly and quietly. As we get about 20 feet away from the moving grass, it stops. Then we hear the whistle coming from exactly where our flashlights are shining on the now still grass. We are frozen in fear, we are too scared to speak to each other. It feels like minutes pass but was probably only a few seconds. I go to take a step forward and all of a sudden the grass starts to move again. This time away from us towards the wood line. Only this time it's fast, too fast for us to run after. So we just stand and watch. We watch as the moving grass reaches the woods. We both have our flashlights focused on it. And again, the whistle. Coming from the woods where the grass just stopped moving. Only this time, the whistle is quiet. This is the part that shocks us. We are now shining our flashlights into the woods, there are several large trees in our view. This thing stands up. It looked like a child, but not? It's hard to explain, but it was humanoid in form and it had illuminated blue eyes. Despite our flashlights shining directly onto the figure it seemed clouded in darkness. Before we could even call out, it stepped behind a tree and was gone. We gathered up the courage to go after it. As we get to the tree, there is nothing. No footprints, no leaves crunching like you would expect to hear in autumn. It was like it vanished into nothing. We spent the next hour checking reports for missing children in the area, and we could find nothing. The creepiest part is that it must have been running on all fours when it was in the grass. We have a children's psychiatric hospital in the town but they had no reports of escapees. To this day we cannot explain it. And to this day we continue to park there. Three years have passed and we never had another experience like that. But my partner is now a believer. And everyone in the department thinks we are crazy. I decided that I would share some of my grandfather's stories he told me about his time working as a forester in Michigan's Manistee National Forest. He never got a chance to write any of his experiences down so I thought I might post them here. For some background, my grandpa started working in the Manistee area in 1949, when he was 28 years old. Before then he had been drifting around the region, doing odd jobs and logging until he was hired by the Forest Service in the northwest part of Michigan's Lower Peninsula. The work, as I understand, was slow and most days he and his crew were sent to different parts of the forest to address various tree and land concerns. Grandpa was always an avid outdoorsman, and he enjoyed hunting and fishing just about as much as anyone in the region. Sadly he died in December of 1998, when I was still rather young, but I remember whenever we went to visit him and grandma he would sit my brother and me down and tell us about his days in the forest service. Working outside every day allowed him to witness all sorts of wildlife, like black bears, whitetail, foxes, and even bobcats back in those days. He often relived his encounters with bears while he was deep in the forest, telling us that those moments were some of the most memorable of his life, being up close to such beautiful and powerful animals. Usually, his tales were exciting, and the enthusiasm with which he told them inspired us to go out to the backyard and look for animals in between the pines. Although there wasn't much wildlife around grandma and grandpa's property, they still always kept a close eye on us and never let us wander too far from the house. Finally, a few years before his death, grandpa deemed my brother and me old enough to be told why. I was about nine, and my brother was about 11 when grandpa first opened up about the strangest things that had ever happened to him. 
All our childhoods we had heard him go on and on about the peace that the wilderness brought him, or used to bring him, but this time his tone was completely different. I don't remember all the details, but I asked my brother to help piece together grandpa's story, and my dad as well, he too had heard of the experiences in question, multiple times. It was the mid-fifties, he never gave the exact year, and October had rolled in behind cool autumn breezes and the sound of Canada geese flying southward. The first of his strange stories had occurred at night, as he was driving home from a local bar where he and his crew had spent the last few hours after work. It was a windy night, and the pines on either side of the road were blowing ferociously. No moon or stars could be seen through thick cloud cover, so the only illumination of the road ahead came from Grandpa's headlights. By his reckoning, he must have been going close to 50 miles per hour at the very moment when something huge leapt across the road not 20 feet ahead of him. His headlights had shown the animal's silhouette, it was dog-shaped, but massive, almost stretching all the way across the road. It only made one bound to get from one side to the other, and its size alone was enough to unnerve Grandpa. At the time, he had assumed that the animal was just a very large wolf, except timber wolves hadn't been spotted in that region for decades. He considered it a bizarre encounter, but nothing came of it that night and he was able to return home without anything else strange happening to him. The second of his stories admittedly frightened me enough to avoid going outside at night for years. Even now I'm wary of noises in the dark because of the obvious fear in Grandpa's voice when he told us of his second experience. Some details here were provided by my dad. It occurred in the same month as his first encounter, a few weeks later, on a night that was pretty cold for the season. It may have hit 40 degrees, but it was a calm night with little wind. Grandpa's house at the time was really small, and it stood in a lot with about six other similarly sized and built edifices. None of his neighbors tended to stay up very late, so it surprised him to be awakened by loud noises at about one in the morning. They sounded like scratching on sheet metal, with occasional thumps and bumps like an animal was trying to get in. Grandpa apparently got up, fetched a flashlight, put on his boots, and went out into the front room, the walls of which consisted of mosquito screens stretched between wooden framework. Once in the front room, Grandpa could hear the sounds more clearly, and they were coming from the nearest of his neighbor's homes maybe 50 yards to his right. It was incredibly dark out there, with no street lights to illuminate. The neighbor's house had a porch light on, but Grandpa couldn't make out what was creating the racket through the screen, so he slowly opened the front door and looked out. He described to us in great detail the animals that he saw there, and he always said he would remember them exactly as they were, for fear Brand's memories the strongest. Three massive dogs covered in long black hair were up against his neighbor's house, scratching at the siding and making visible claw marks with every swipe. Each beast stood about seven feet tall, with their front legs stretching for another two or three feet and easily reaching the roofing and the gutter of the house. Their scratching, however, did not make it seem like they were trying to get into the house, as Grandpa explained. He thought that they were doing that to get whoever was inside out. The next part was actually the hardest to get out of Grandpa, it was strange that he was so eager to tell us everything thus far, despite how he felt about the subject but he was rather hesitant as I remember to divulge the last horrifying details of his encounter. He claims that the animals then noticed that he had emerged from his own house, just across the lawn, for each one turned to look straight at him, just 50 yards away. They had pointed ears like a wolf's, and huge bodies that rivaled large black bears in size. They also supported themselves not with four legs, like any other native mammal, but instead, they stood on two legs each, towering seven feet above the ground. The sounds that they proceeded to make, Grandpa had said, would haunt his dreams for the rest of his life. It was a shame that he could neither produce recordings nor accurately mimic the UN wolf-like screams the animals made, for that detail always fascinated me the most about his story. They didn't sound like foxes, coyotes, or bobcats, instead, they forced half-scream, half howls out of their jaws that Grandpa was sure held the teeth of a carnivore. Grandpa never told us exactly what happened next, I guess we assumed that he ran inside, locked the doors, and didn't look outside until morning. 
He would tell us that four of his neighbors, including the elderly couple that lived in the nearest house, didn't stick around very long. He did say that he tried to talk to them about what had happened that night, but they remained evasive and never gave him any straight answers. That turned out to be somewhat ironic because Grandpa himself kept tight-lipped about many of the details of his stories. He would say that he heard those exact screams on two other occasions, both times while he was in the Manistee Forest, and he showed us an old Forest Service report detailing a possible timber wolf sighting in the area complete with photographs of huge padded paw prints in mud. The thing is, Grandpa never told anyone his stories but his most trusted family, which is unique among Michigan dogman witnesses. After the craze that Steve Cook's legend song stirred in the 80s, it's no wonder that so many stories from the region surfaced. I had heard a few bits and pieces about the so-called monster before Grandpa told his tale, but it wasn't until later in life that I realized his encounters had to have been with the same creature. Whether I believe him that massive wolves walk upright through Michigan forests, well I'm still not so sure. But as a modern zoological curiosity, the stories of strange beasts from a passionate woodsman who knew his wildlife certainly remain among the most remarkable I've heard, simply because of the genuine emotion with which he related his tales. Legends like these might just be figments of our collective imagination, so all I can do is present what I've heard and let others judge for themselves what is real and what is pure fiction. Anyway, as the song goes, don't go out at night. I'm a Silicon Valley, San Jose, California, native and have frequented the adjacent Santa Cruz Mountains all my life. This incident happened on the Loma Prieta grade trail in the forest of Nicene Mark State Park in the late summer of 2019. My girlfriend at the time and I were hiking on a Wednesday morning. There were already people around. This is a popular trail as it's a really beautiful locale. That said, there were also stretches when it was just the two of us. I think it's a 5 mile hike total and we were about an hour in when my girlfriend had to relieve herself. There were thick trees on both sides, so we looked for a clearing on our right side. We saw not really a path, but an opening, and walked past the tree line, maybe 20 to 30 feet in. She wanted to be out of sight of anyone who passed by. I tossed her my backpack which had toilet paper and she ducked behind a tree. I walked back down the clearing about halfway, but I could still see her. She's squatting and I'm just waiting. Like I said I could see her the whole time. It was darker inside the trees obviously, but I could still see just fine. So I'm standing there with nothing to do but look around me. That's when I caught the movement of something on my left. There was a medium sized tree with a very distinct, very dark, hand on it. It was about 10 or so feet away. At first, I thought it was someone wearing black gloves. I don't know why but I immediately thought it was some biker pervert looking in on my girlfriend. That's when I saw the face peek out and everything turned upside down. I can't say with full certainty but I'd say it was 7 to 8 feet tall, easy, I'm 6 foot 2. I only saw a half of it but it was everything you would expect from a classic description of Bigfoot. Big black eyes, large flat nose, dark skin with blackish grayish hair. I could see only a hint of a conical skull. Really based on nothing in particular, I feel like I saw a female. Not sure why, I just do. Anyway, it peeked back and forth twice. The eyes were mesmerizing, that's the best way to describe it. They felt like they were looking right through my soul. I wasn't scared really, but I was definitely in shock, like the way seeing a car accident feels like everything is in slow motion. And let me confirm what others say, there was no way I had the wherewithal to pull out my phone and take a picture. No way. I was totally engrossed in the moment. This was all in the space of maybe 20 to 30 seconds. The second time it peeked out, it looked at me for a few seconds then ducked back behind the tree but also sank like it was going onto the ground. That was the last I saw of it. My girlfriend finally finished and when she came back toward me that was when the fear hit me. Not like I was in danger right at that moment but more like the reality of what I saw finally hit me. I quickly took her hand and pulled her back onto the trail. I didn't say what I saw, but I said we had to go back ASAP. 
She was confused but I explained to her what I saw as we walked back, at a much brisker pace than when we came up. She believed me, she's Canadian and has an uncle and cousin who claimed to see one when she was growing up, so that was good. She actually wanted to turn around and see if we could find it, but I wasn't quite in that space just after it happened. I'd say I was generally a Bigfoot believer before this, but not anywhere near a fanatic or anything and it's not like I set out looking for anything. I know people argue that if you have Bigfoot on the brain you're more likely to jump to that conclusion in certain situations. I did not. In fact the whole hike I was complaining to my girlfriend about my manager at work. Bigfoot was the last thing on my mind. I'm okay with what happened, but I had strange dreams for weeks after. My girlfriend thought it was a great story and she'd tell our friends over beers and stuff, but I'm not entirely comfortable with people knowing. But like I said, I'm far away from it now to at least share it here. Yeah, it's possible a, huge, guy in a suit was out there at that exact time and in that exact spot, but I don't think so. I'm 99% sure I saw a Sasquatch. I have heard of and seen reptoid beings in the area 5 miles east of Phoenix, Arizona. The Superstition Mountain has been an area of encounters and is said to have both an alien base and laboratories under it. The military also has an underground base there and interacts in experiments with the aliens. About 20 years ago I encountered an individual that spent time exploring some of the old mines in the area. He had vanished for months before I ran into him again. I asked him where he had been all this time. Here is his story. He spotted a mine entrance on the west side of the main mount side. He said that the mine looked to be in good shape, so he started walking in the shaft. He had gone about a half mile in when he saw a sign that said no entrance beyond this point. The mine shaft was still in good shape, so he went in 100 yards. He told me that people seemed to come out of the walls of the shaft. Men in black uniforms questioned him and then took him to a holding area in Mesa, Arizona for 72 hours. They questioned him again and found out that his home was in Colorado. They gave him a plane ticket to Denver, Colorado, and told him never to come back to the Phoenix area. He asked me not to tell anyone that I had seen him. He wanted to pick up personal items that got left behind. I have never seen him after that. There are other stories of treasure hunters going into old mine shafts and finding holographic walls in the shaft. They did not try to enter the area behind the wall as they feared that they might not be able to get back out. They told me that they took a round rock and rolled it through the screen and heard it roll for some distance. One of them reached through the screen with a flashlight in his hand. He turned the flashlight back toward the screen, but could not see any light. He said that he withdrew his arm as he had the feeling that something was back there and he didn't want it to grab his arm and drag him in. I asked the men to take me up there and show me the mine. They all said no way they were going back in there. We got a topo map out and they showed me the area where they had encountered the wall. I did go into the area to search but was never able to find the mine. This is not strange as other people have found an opening and marked the entrance with a pyramid of large rocks and left to get lights and more people and equipment. When they got back, the rocks were still there as they had stacked them, but the entrance is gone. There have been sightings of reptoids about 9 feet tall in that area. As soon as they sense that they are being watched they vanish. People have also seen lizard beings about the size of a man with bat-like wings and a tail. They fly out to the opening in the cliffs at twilight and also vanish since they are being watched. The Native Americans have seen these things for hundreds of years and have legends about them. They say that they are shapeshifters and can make you see them in any form they want. I found this out on a personal encounter with a reptoid I encountered on a trail. As I was walking up an inner trail in the mounts I looked up and saw a man coming towards me on the trail. He had appeared out of thin air. As I walked toward him I noticed his eyes, they were reptoid, vertical slits. When he sensed that I knew what he was, he hit me with a psychic blow that I can only describe as being hit in the head with a sledgehammer. It stunned me and almost drove me to my knees. As I shook this off I looked up and he was gone. I had a headache for two days after that and think that he could have killed me if he wanted to. 
This is just some of the strange things that have been seen up there. We have seen different types of alien craft that appear to enter the main mount ghost orbs and UFO orbs that have been seen in different areas for hundreds of years that disappear at different old mines, and wells, and some just enter the face of the mounts. I would love to get in touch with a well-equipped investigative group and have them check out some of the strong magnetic fields that may act as dimensional portholes where some of these creatures come and go. The fact that the encounter in Missouri was in a Navy storage area is no surprise. They have been given reign over housing UFOs and aliens since the formation of MJ-12 after the Roswell crash. One day our government may tell us the truth on their involvement with alien encounters and tech that has been traded for their abduction of us. First off I would like to say I am not sure what these things are. All of this is 100% true. My dad and brother have lake houses right next to each other in upstate New York on Lake Ontario. They are in a very secluded area on a peninsula. You can only get there by boat or by walking down a mile long path deep through a forest. One winter morning we were all getting ready to go out and play after a night of heavy snowfall. My uncle looked out the window toward the path we used to get back and forth from the parking lot to our houses. As he looked out he saw a pair of the eeriest, strangest looking deer he or I had ever seen. They had all grey fur, long dark almond shaped eyes that stared intently and their antlers were two long jagged horns protruding straight out from their skull. These deer were like none either of us had seen. My grandmother walked outside to take pictures of them, after she snapped a few pictures they seemed to just walk away. The two deer silently strolled into the woods, not making a single sound. They did not even have to hop the slightest bit through the foot of snow on the ground. What makes this even weirder and actually startling has to do with the pictures. After looking back neither of the deer showed up in any of the pictures taken. The camera was fine, as everything but where the deer were standing was clearly photographed. Even what was behind the deer showed up in the photos. When we walked over to where they had been walking, no more snow had fallen, this was a minute or two after they walked away, no tracks were found. The snow appeared untouched. I know this story isn't exactly scary but it is intriguing and a strange mystery. A few years later my cousins and I were walking down the path. We all have a strange feeling I can only describe as dread. It was like the feeling you get when you are sitting outside the principal's office waiting to be called in. We looked over and saw two deer just like the ones before. The forest floor around the path was covered in leaves and dry brush, but we did not hear them walking around. The two deer were pacing, watching us. At least that's how I felt at the time and still feel to this day. The deer turned their heads simultaneously the second we looked at them. We exchanged excruciating eye contact for around 10 seconds or so. It could have been longer for all I know. It just felt so odd. Then they proceeded to walk over a hill out of sight. We did not hear them walk away. It's like they float above the ground. This was in the early 2000s and they have not been seen since. This is still a topic of conversation for our family to this day. Also, there are many other creepier things that I have seen up at our lake house if anyone is interested. We still talk about it. I've been reading about the Glimmer Man phenomenon and its similarity to the cloaked alien in the Predator film series. I saw something very similar a few years ago. It was probably about four years ago. I lived in the very northern part of Frederick County, Maryland, near Thurmont, not too far south of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Behind my house was a few acres of woods with a small creek right past the tree line. We had about two acres of lawn before the woods started. This area of Frederick County is very rural, with lots of forests and farms, very near Cunningham Falls State Park, a huge wooded area with lakes and the tallest waterfall in the state. In fact, Camp David is located in the area. Anyway, I was sitting on my second story back deck and noticed movement in the tree line. It was a nice day, I think early fall, it was not a hot day and not raining. I saw the outline of something big moving perpendicular away from me in the woods. It was a shimmer, like heat waves, 
completely invisible except you can see the air being displaced, and made me think of the predator right away because it was just like heat waves rising from a hot surface. It seemed to be a humanoid shape in that it was taller than wide, like a tall, fit, bipedal outline. It was hard to judge the height from my perspective in the distance, but it was taller than the average man, probably about 10 feet tall at least. I never heard of someone else seeing something similar before. I only saw it once, and that was enough for me. In 1987, I experienced an event which I later recalled while under hypnosis. After the regression session, I was able to remember some other details including that I had missed about three hours during the incident. I was living in Arizona near the Santa Catalina Mountains. One afternoon as I was sitting in a lounge chair on our back porch I suddenly realized that I was being dragged into a craft by two small aliens. The next thing I remembered was waking up on a table inside the small craft. A guide greeted me and gave me something to drink. I believe that it was a stimulant of some kind because I was not sleepy after I drank the substance. In fact, the taste was quite pleasing. I was then taken out of the craft, looked around noticed I was standing on top of a hill. It was dark, but I noticed a light near a cavern. I walked up to this area and it was then that I saw a man, dressed in a red military type jumpsuit. My guide seemed to know this man as he greeted him. I also noticed that he wore some type of patch and was carrying an automatic weapon. When we walked into the tunnel, I realized they were going right into the side of a large hill or mountain. There we met with another guard in red and I saw a computerized checkpoint with two cameras on each side. To my left was a large groove where a small transit vehicle carried people further inside. To my right, I saw a long hallway where there were many offices. We took the transit car and went for what seemed to be a very long time to another secure area. I was then told to step onto some type of device that looked like a scale and face the computer screen. I saw lights flashing and numbers computing and then a card was issued with holes punched into it. It appeared to be an ID card. My guide did not speak much but did tell me that we had just entered level 1 of the facility. I was eventually transported to a lower level where I witnessed additional armed guards. I was then taken down another hall and there I noticed a horrible putrid smell. I then saw huge tanks with computerized gauges hooked to them and a huge arm-like device that extended from the top of some tubing down into the tanks. In a large laboratory-like room I noticed a small grey being with his back turned to me working on something at a computer. I was then told to sit at a table in the middle of the room. About this time a man, human, dressed like a doctor entered the room. He wore a white lab coat with a badge. The temperature in the room seemed awfully cold. By this time I was frustrated and began to cry and to tremble. Then suddenly I felt a stabbing pain. Screamed and the human doctor stood next to me and rubbed something over my stomach. The pain immediately subsided. Soon I became drowsy and was returned to the porch. When I awoke I was laying on the porch floor by the door. For several months after that day, I knew something had happened but I was unable to comprehend what it was. That is why I sought medical help. I have not had any other encounters but believe that I will in the future though I was never told this. One day in autumn 2015 I came home from school early as I skipped the last three classes, I lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was around 12 noon. All the lights in my house were off, and I was wearing earphones. I went from my kitchen to the living room and as I looked at the small couch we have in my parents' house I saw a thing staring back at me. It wasn't for a split second, it was staring at me for like 3 to 5 seconds, front facing me so I know it wasn't just my brain, eyes mistaking a random object for a human-sized being. It wasn't very tall, about 5 feet would be the tallest it could have been. It had a human-like body shape. Its skin looked like candle wax and it was very wrinkly. Kind of reminded me of E.T. but it looked way more old and pretty much dead. Its hands weren't human-like and had long dark nails. Its eyes were all black and they looked hollow. It had brownish hair on its head, legs, and arms. It didn't do anything, just stared at me for some seconds. 
I looked away or blinked, I don't remember which one, and it left or just vanished. When it looked at me I felt both terrified and in awe. But it looked familiar, even if I haven't seen it before, or since, I felt like its intentions weren't necessarily bad I don't think it was a hallucination, because there is no history of schizophrenia or anything similar in the family. There is no history of any mental illness on both sides. I would like to know if anyone knows anything about this creature or if anyone has a similar experience. I don't think it had ears. As for a nose, I don't remember clearly. If it did have a nose it was just a small black opening on its face, where a human's nose would normally be. Its face was a mixture of demonic and alien features, only the body was humanoid. Its eyes didn't indicate aggressive behavior exactly. It was more that it was staring at me out of curiosity, but it looked pretty alert and ready to fight, back. Its face was wax-like and wrinkly like the rest of its body. A weird kind of oval shape if I recall correctly. So I'm 45 now. I was thinking about this randomly and was bored, so I decided to ask if anyone had an experience with the board. A real experience. I'm actually afraid to talk about it. I was 12 when I first started using one by myself. It started moving just fine. I became obsessed with it and used it regularly for about a year and a half. There was a name. When I asked who I was talking to, it spelled out Bobby Mahalovich. I'm not sure of the spelling of his last name, so I don't know. All I know is I'm afraid to talk about it because I did it by myself for a few years, and I can still remember that it was moving on its own. I would even try to trick it sometimes by lifting my fingers off the planchette, and it would continue to move for about an inch before stopping. One time it even levitated while I was using it with my brother and friend. You could feel the pressure of the plastic pushing on our fingers upward and we pulled away when it got to be a few inches in the air. But I'm mostly concerned with my own experiences and using it by myself. I mean, I used to come home from school and just hop on the board like no big deal. No one told me it was fake or demonic. I just thought it worked. It felt creepy but natural at the same time. What I'm telling you is the truth. I saw, felt it move. I talked to this thing for hours. I was old enough to know if it was fake or bogus. I see a lot of people telling stories about the board, but I don't believe them because if you really had used one the way I did, you wouldn't want to talk about it. Until now, anyway. Is there anyone else out there who has experienced this? Bobby Mahalovich? I've been wanting to speak about this for a while. This happened around April 2018 while I was staying at my aunt's apartment in Aurora, Colorado. Her apartment was located on the second top floor behind a high school field. It was around 2 to 3 in the morning, and I got up to use the restroom when I decided to stop by the kitchen and look out the window. To my surprise, I came across what I can only imagine as a skinwalker. It was pale and had glowing eyes along with spider-like limbs. It was digging into the ground and I was too shocked in the moment to think about recording. It's been five years since then, and I can't stop thinking about it. Has anybody ever come across this, or does anybody have any additional information about this? I'd love to know, please. Story time. The other day, I remember this one little story that happened to one of my friends as old neighbors. His old neighbor lived in a really small RV park. Anyways, he liked to go back there to visit her a lot, since they were pretty close. I was his ride at the time, so I would usually end up hanging out there with him. The small RV park was located right off a main road or highway that led directly into one of our small, historic townships. The park was shaded by mostly tall oak trees, so it was often nice and breezy in the hot summers. Since it was such a small neighborhood in the RV park, everyone had no choice, but to know everyone. While we were hanging out over there one day, my friend's former neighbor and her other neighbor started commenting on the fact that there were tons of ants. That was unusual to them, since they had lived there for years and never had that problem before. Eventually, 
After dealing with the ants being absolutely everywhere for a couple days, my friend's old neighbor decided to go outside and try to track the ant trails to see where they were maybe coming from. She ended up tracking them to an RV that was one space away from hers. There, she found several trails of them both going into and coming from this man's RV. Everyone in the little neighborhood knew that the man who lived in that RV, was somewhat of a hoarder and he was not clean at all. So, she knocked on his door a few times, but he didn't seem to be there so she decided to tape a note on his door for when he got home. In the note, she asked that he please have his son maybe pick up some ant traps, and also to have him maybe clean up a little. The man who lived there was quite weak and ill with MRSA. I believe MRSA is a disease that can be passed through bodily fluids and such and I also believe it is eventually fatal. Thankfully though, he had his son around to do his errands and some other things to help care for him. A couple days after she'd left the note on his door, she got a knock on her door and it was the man's son. What he had to say was the grossest and most horrifying thing to me. What had happened was that when the man's son came by to take his dad to an appointment, he knocked but didn't get an answer. As he was waiting for his dad to answer, he realized that he hadn't heard from him in almost a week. I guess his dad usually called him at least every other day or so. Since his dad wasn't answering him, his son went to go grab the spare key that his dad had given to him previously. When he let himself into his dad's RV, he made a morbid and terrifying discovery. He found his dad's decomposing body, still in his bed, totally covered in ants. He ran out of there, and it didn't take long for a neighbor to find him sobbing next to his vehicle. Within minutes, the whole small community had heard the gruesome news. As it just so happened, I had taken my friend over there for us all to hang out again on the day his old neighbor had heard the terrible news. We didn't even get a chance to sit down before she was already telling us about it. As she was telling us about all the ants on his body, I just couldn't help but to think about how ants come into your house, crawl all over your sinks, counters and dishes, and even in your food. So, for whatever reason, the ants were truly the most horrific part to me. After all, MRSA can be passed through bodily fluids. We didn't go back there for a while after hearing that. When we did though, they were still in the process of trying to move the RV out of there and that was after a man in a full hazmat suit spent days cleaning it out. The whole thing just kinda freaked us all out though, especially the damn ants, for real. In high school I went camping in Ocala National Forest with some friends. At one point, late at night, a few of us snuck away from the rest of the group. We explored a trail that left us at the edge of a highway. While sitting in what we thought was a secluded area a car drove by and everyone decided to duck down. The car stopped and we heard the doors open, slam shut, and then heavy footsteps were running towards us. We got up and started running back to camp. We could hear the footsteps gaining on the pavement as we entered the forest followed by the crash of large bodies breaking through the underbrush. At one point my buddy Rob stopped short and yelled, banana spider. Suspended before him was a banana spider the size of my hand. She was in the center of a beautiful web. I, on the other hand, remembered that dudes in rural Florida were chasing us. I screamed, not today, mother F and shoved Rob through the spider web and back into camp. In the army. During an exercise where we had to dig a pit at night, multiple people saw my buddy in my pit digging when he was definitely not there. He was on piquet out the front of the position. That wouldn't really spook anyone except at one point my section commander saw him standing stationary in the pit at night when he was supposed to be digging. My seco went over to speak to him and said what are you doing? At which point he got out of the pit and sprinted off into the bush without a word, in complete darkness. That is simply not something you do in an army position. There are pits, barbed wire etc everywhere. At the time he was actually on piquet, guard duty, with another soldier. I really love through hiking and climbing, so I sleep outside for a great part of the summer each year, almost never using tents because they are heavy as heck and also prohibited in most parts of my mountains. I've had many scary encounters with animals, mostly due to the inhuman shrieks they can produce, but let me tell you this, in all of nature, 
nothing is as scary as people. That's why I prefer camping deep in the woods to being just outside of the city limits. It's always better to find a family of wild hogs going through your stuff at 3 a.m. than to find a family of coked out drug addicts going through your stuff at 3 a.m. But anyways, here are two of the stories, of encountering people, that came to my mind. The first one, we were actually using tents because this was more of a get together and drink thing with my classmates at a nearby lake. So the night is surely upon us, and we decide to gather some wood in the nearby forest to keep the fire going through the night. My pal and I take on this task, and as we approach the woods, we see there is another tent pitched right out of sight of our camping site. As we pass it, a dude pops out of the tent. We make small friendly chat about us staying there and him just camping and whatnot, and then we excuse ourselves, saying that we need to get some wood for the fire. All fine and dandy, nothing unusual, Camping folks are usually chatty and friendly. Except for two things, by the setup of the tent and camping ground, he must have been there for a few days and he planned to stay there for a while, which is okay, as there are lots of photographers doing this as the place is famous for its sunrises, although I still shiver thinking about all the heavy tarps lying around. Secondly, he advised us to split as there were two paths going through the woods so that we can cover more ground. Which we did because why not? He looked like he knew the area. So I am walking alone through the woods, my mate taking the other path which was directly above mine, and he could still see down on my trail. When I hear him shout my name, so I turn around to see what's happening, and I see the guy from the tent following me on the trail, which he saw from above, wielding a freaking machete. The guy says that after we left, he realized we didn't have any axe or anything to chop down the wood, although we said we were collecting the wood, also chopping it down would be illegal there, so he thought he would help me with that. Which I politely refused and got the hell out of there, meeting my mate who was already on his route there. So we came back to the camping site with next to no fuel for the fire, and everyone keeps making fun of us, saying that. We are paranoid and the guy surely wanted to help. Whatever, we proceed to drink, and night falls. We almost forgot about the incident, and all is well again, when I see a headlamp approaching our campsite. It is that guy from the tent coming to our site. He is bearing a bunch of wood in his arms, saying that he knew we didn't take much of the fuel so he brought us some. Then he walks all around our camping site before putting it down, I mean, there was really no need for that as the fire was in the middle, checking the tents, asking whether this is all of us and if someone else is coming, not creepy at all. After a moment of uncomfortable silence, he tells us to enjoy our night and gets out. Understandably, everybody is creeped out by now, and different theories pop up, such as that he brought the wood only to make sure that we won't kill the fire before we go to sleep so that he knows when that happens or that the occasional flash from the direction of his campsite is the flash from his binoculars. Well, no one went to sleep that night, and we were not drinking anymore. After the sun went up, we took a two-hour nap, rotating guards, and packed our shit and left as soon as possible. The other one, we were on a climbing trip and slept under the stars really deep in the woods, well off all the known trails and places in the area, as sleeping there is prohibited, and the rangers are very strict about this, issuing very large fines if they catch you, so essentially we were hiding deep in the woods. We cooked some great dinner, man, nothing tastes so good as an MRE after a full day of climbing camped out in the mountains, drank some wine, talked shit a bit, and went to sleep as we were really tired. At about 2 am, we are all woken up, there were four of us, by voices, by a shitload of voices. It sounded like a school trip somewhere in the distance, lots of kids talking to each other, presumably walking in a group. That itself was scary as heck, a bunch of kids walking in the woods at 2 am and they must have been off any trail as we went on purpose out of the reach of any of the known trails. No one is talking, we all sit there and listen. The voices pass. Then the second wave of similar groups of voices passes nearby, and then we hear someone approach our site through the woods. There must be more of them based on the sounds they are making, and then it happened. It was a group of five kids, roughly 13 years old, walking in the direction of the voices. They walk around our site, silently greeting us and nodding in our direction as they pass about three meters from our sleeping bags and continue towards all the voices. To make it all more creepy, 
none of them had any headlamp or flashlight or any source of light. It was a full moon, so the visibility was good, but still. I have no idea what that was supposed to mean, but it was really weird and honestly scary. It could have been some scouts as that was a well-established outdoorsy place, the whole area, but still, a bunch of kids alone in the woods well off any known trail, walking without any source of light at 2 am, just right by us. There are lots of weird things happening when you camp, but trust me, nothing is as scary as other human beings. I'm not even sure if I'm explaining this right because I don't have the right words but I'm gonna try. I have three kids, and they're pretty active. It was a summer evening in 2020. The boys asked to go outside into the yard so I said yes and they headed into the back. I had to go to the bathroom so I had to walk past my boys room to get there. They had left the dresser light on which was against the wall shared with the bathroom wall. When I walked past the door, something huge flew past the light making a shadow that had wings. Not like bird wings or insects but like those cartoons or drawings of demons where they have like pointy edges in the flaps. It also saw a brief flash of bright red color for a second. It literally scared me so much that I jumped back and hesitated walking by the door, but I heard some toys shift and the dresser being closed. But, there is no one else inside the house. My kids are outside with my husband and I'm alone, or was I, so I thought? So what the hell would make that shadow? I walked into the room and everything was normal looking except my son's Gundams, which are these Japanese build-yourself toys of giant robots that vary in size. The one that normally is up on the shelf, too high for my kids to reach, was down on the dresser away from the other three that are on the shelf above. Now normally I would just assume that my son was fixing it or something but it just didn't add up as I had been inside doing laundry, putting clothes in that same dresser just a few minutes before. My son hadn't been in his room, and my other son could not reach them and would break them if he grabbed them. When I went outside I asked everyone if they had been moving the Gundams or fixing them and instantly my oldest was concerned someone broke it and had to go check, saying he hadn't touched it since we put them on the shelf. Now, when he returned from their room, he was annoyed asking me why I was making stuff up about the Gundams because they're all in their places. I asked about the one on the dresser and he said, no, you put it back just fine, thank you for being gentle. I cannot reach the shelf without a chair or stepladder and neither of those things are in their room, so whatever moved that thing made me look crazy or like I was playing some prank. So what was in the room and how was it big enough to cast a shadow that darkened the whole room? Maybe it was just my mind playing tricks on itself. But my dog hasn't gone into the boys room since and both of my boys slept in the living room last night, saying they kept hearing scraping and scratches in the wall behind the dresser. Two things, same trip. Not really the woods, but might as well share. Me and my friends, Mexican graphic design students, went to the Laguna Salada, Salty Lagoon, in Baja California, Mexico, to watch the Milky Way and shoot some star trails photography. The Laguna Salada is a vast patch of salt encrusted land that was once a lake. It dried quite a bit ago, and you can actually find ancient bleached seashells if you check carefully. Anyways, we arrive at an entrance from the highway and drive around 500 meter deep into the Salada. We come to a nice spot with a lot of bushes at one side while clear on the other, we thought this was perfect, as the bushes would block out the car headlights from the road. We stop and get out of the car, then we all notice this strange, hissing or rattling sound all around us. Imagine being surrounded by invisible people playing maracas some far, some closer. We are so puzzled and fascinated by the sound that we start to throw out theories about what it could be. A friend says it might be echo from the cars, other says they're insects, and another one, jokingly says alien probes man etc. With that put aside, we set up the tripod, camera, shutter switch, we shoot some test shots and after everything is right, we leave the camera with the lens open to shoot the star trails. We grab some lanterns and decide to go exploring. After walking about 15 minutes, one friend says, in a very fearful voice, two men are coming at us. We are like yeah bro, nice try but he repeats not kidding, two men are coming at us, and they got assault rifles. 
Almost instantly, the two men yell, turn off the flashlights, turn up the flashlights now and we're all like F he's right, we are scared shitless and do as the men command. They get close and say, don't move, keep your hands down, don't do sudden movements and then they start asking questions in a very aggressive tone, who are you, what are you doing here, how old are you, what are your names, how long have you been here etc. After explaining ourselves, they start whispering shit to themselves while pointing their rifles at us. We are all frozen with fear, believing we were going to be executed right there for being at the wrong place at the wrong time. One of the men say, go back to your car and keep taking your photos, but do not go near that bush patch because, and I quote him, rifles tend to misfire in there. As we are walking away from them, I was pretty sure we stumbled into a bunch of narcos doing some shady shit there. I'm sure we are going to be sprayed from the back, I'm just walking slowly, as our flashlights are off, waiting for that hot lead to enter my back. You know how they say that your life flashes in front of you when you feel you're close to death? I can assure you it's not a lie. Past Christmas come to my mind, me opening my sweet Super Nintendo, graduating from high school, past girlfriends, etc. I even start to get angry at life, telling myself I'm going to get killed by a scum narco all because of some photos. Thank God, nothing happened. We get the message and decide to nope the F from there. We decide to haul ass and get the F out before we become another number in Mexico's narco wars. As we are all grabbing our shit and packing up, we hear a loud rattling in the floor, a friend turns a flashlight and turns out it is a baby rattlesnake, inches from my friend's feet in an attack posture, with rattle shaking like crazy and all, ready to strike. We cannot believe how stupid we were, all the sounds we heard in the beginning turned out to be rattlesnakes, all around us. Narcos and rattlesnakes. We noped the F out of there and never came back. Could it have been the Jersey Devil? I was homeless for a few years from 2018 to 2021 and I used to stay in a tent with my ex-boyfriend in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. I always had to end up moving my tent spot eventually because the cops would find us. Either way I had spent a lot of the time in the woods at night. One night when walking back to my tent, I heard something down the trail a bit. I shined my light in the direction of the sound to be met with glowing eyes reflecting my flashlight. However, where the eyes were made it so whatever I was looking at was taller than me and I'm 5 foot 8 inches. There is no animal that tall in the area. I turn to my ex and tell him to start going to the tent faster. He could tell something was off, so he asked if I was alright. I told him I'll tell him when we get to the tent because I have always been told not to acknowledge such creatures or spirits as it gives them more power. Then some nights there would be smacking on our tent. It would hit all the sides of the tent. We would look out the tent windows and check outside the tent but we would never find anything or hear any footsteps. Another night, during the summer, we decided to go for a small hike at night because it was way more of a tolerable temperature. About 15 minutes into the hike I started feeling paranoid, like I was being watched. About 5 minutes later, I heard a maniacal laugh coming from somewhere in the woods. I couldn't pinpoint which direction though. My ex asked what was that, and I loudly said, I don't know but whatever it is needs to stop. As soon as I said this, Multiple maniacal laughs now started. My ex and I turned around and walked back for what felt like the longest 20 minutes. Another time I found a severed coyote head with something hung in the tree beside it, that had a tooth in it. And lastly, one time I was with my friend parked on the road far into the woods, so we could smoke. The passenger window was down, which is where I was sitting. The woods were right next to me. Again the feeling of being watched overwhelmed me. Two minutes or so later I heard a hello? And then John? Coming from the woods. I tell my friend to turn around and we need to leave. I didn't tell her why because like I said I don't like to acknowledge these things until I'm far away from them. I am pretty late to the party, but my mother has a great camping story. In their late 20s her and my father were teaching in Lesotho. On the holidays they would go on camping trips in the massive parks in Zimbabwe. They were young and stupid, and didn't know the dangers of camping in Africa, and they had my sister with them, who would have been less than a year old at the time. One night, they were camping in a tent and had my sister between them, when they heard sounds outside. 
They say it sort of sounded like someone coughing. My sister were making baby noises, and it seemed like it attracted more coughing animals outside. Soon it sounded like a whole pack of something was outside the tent. My parents had no firearms, and no knife or axe close by. One of the animale then start sniffing the tent, and it seems like it was trying to dig under it to get to my, now crying, sister. My panicked parents were trying to find a way to save themselves and my sister, and in a panic-induced rage, my mother, with all the might and glory that only a mother who is scared for her child's life can produce, punches the snout of the hyena sniffing the tent. To this day my parents swear that the animal screamed in terror, and the whole pack ran off. This is a terrifying tale, the story of a Bigfoot war that allegedly took place in eastern Oklahoma through the years. I finally decided to look into the matter, gather as much information as I could, and decide as to whether the tale might have some truth to it or was an outright fabrication. The following is what I was able to find out. It is said that around 1855, Choctaw people, in what is now LaFleur County, Oklahoma, and farmers in what is now Arkansas, were experiencing some terrifying events. It all began in a rather benign way with the theft of vegetables, a few heads of livestock, and other foodstuff by stealthy bandits in the night. The thieves were quiet and never seen. They're also smart as somehow they never ventured into Choctaw encampments on nights when a watchman was in place. Neither did the bandits ever fall into the traps set for them by farmers outside of Indian territory. Those charged with finding and capturing these marauders began to develop a begrudging respect for the willingness of their adversaries as time went by and the petty thefts continued. While the thefts were annoying and did cause some hardships near the Choctaw or neighboring Anglo farmers were afraid. However, things changed once women and children began to go missing. A group of 30 Choctaw cavalrymen was organized to hunt down the abductors. The group was led by Joshua Lafleur a man of a mix of Choctaw and French blood who was deeply respected by his fellow tribesmen. Also joining the search party was a warrior named Mashulatubi and his six sons. They were huge men, all approaching seven feet in height and weighing more than 300 pounds each, and were regarded as fierce warriors and expert horsemen. The Tubbies were so effective in mountain warfare that despite their massive size they became known as the light horsemen. The contingent of searchers, armed to the teeth, set out into the region known today as the McCurtain County Wilderness Area to search for the kidnappers. After riding all day the searchers finally arrived in the area they believed the bandits to be hiding. Lafleur brought his troops to a halt, stood up in his stirrups, and surveyed the area with a spyglass. It is unclear exactly what Lafleur saw but whatever it was he ordered his men to charge forward toward a stand of pines roughly 500 yards distant. Lafleur and the Tubby men led the attack as the troops closed the distance between themselves and the stand of pines where the kidnappers were thought to be hiding. They were assaulted by a tremendous stench, the unmistakable odor of decay and decomposition. The horses of most of the men began to buck and rear tossing the riders. Only the mounts of Lafleur and Tubby men were disciplined enough to remain composed allowing the eight men to continue through the pines. As the men cleared the small wooded patch they came upon a large earthen mound. Scattered across the mound were the bodies of children and women in various stages of decomposition. Lafleur and the Tubbies caught a glimpse of a number of the murderers fleeing into the tree line on the opposite side of the mound. Only three of the killers stood their ground to meet the charge of the light horsemen. At this time the cavalrymen realized they were not going up against any human foe. Rather, standing before them, while snarling and beating their chests were three huge hair-covered creatures. Despite what must have been a shocking sight to him Lafleur drew his pistol and saber, spurred his mount, and charged. As Lafleur approached the nearest ape it took a mighty swipe and struck his horse in the head killing it instantly. Lafleur managed to roll off of the fallen horse quickly, jumped to his feet, and fired multiple shots into the chest of the creature. Once his pistol was empty Lafleur attacked the ape with the saber opening up gaping wounds on the animal which roared in rage and pain. Lafleur's assault on the creature was so quick and the shock of seeing hair covered monsters so great that the tubby men hesitated, completely stupefied before entering the fray. This delay allowed one of the other two apes to get behind Lafleur who was intensely focused on the ape he had engaged. 
The second beast grabbed LaFleur's head with two huge hands and ripped it from his shoulders. The horrible sight jolted the tubby warriors into action and they opened fire on the three Sasquatches with 50 caliber Sharps buffalo rifles two of the beasts were killed instantly, dropping in their tracks. The third creature was wounded but turned and fled before the lethal shot could be fired. Robert Tubby, only 18 years old but already 6 foot 1 inch and well over 300 pounds, spurred his horse ran down the injured ape, and dispatched it with his hunting knife, as the rest of the troop joined them. The light horsemen surveyed the area the bodies of dead women and children, mostly partially devoured, littered the area. The smell of decay along with the terrible odor of the beast's feces caused many of the men to vomit. After composing themselves the men gathered the remains of the unfortunate women and children and buried them. They also buried their leader Joshua LaFleur. As for the three black ape monsters, their bodies were placed upon a huge bonfire and burned. With their hellish task complete the Choctaw warriors returned to Tuscahoma, Oklahoma where it is said even the mighty tubby men were plagued by terrible nightmares for years afterward. Now, was this story true, and were the details fact? According to a Bigfoot researcher named Jim King, the answer might be yes. King believes the LaFleur County story is based on an event that took place much farther west in Kiowa territory. That event was related to him by an Indian elder. According to the story Kiowa women were placed in a special teepee or tent on the edge of camp. When they started their menstrual cycle the women stayed there being tended to only by older women until their cycle was complete. The elder told King that women were considered unclean during their cycles and Kiowa warriors were forbidden any physical contact with the females during this time. They're not even to look upon them. This seems harsh but it's not too different than how many cultures treated menstruating women in the past. The elders said that once long ago there had been trouble with ape-like creatures who were attracted by the scent and pheromones emanating from the tent where the menstruating women were housed. Since the tent was on the edge of the encampment it proved to be an easy target for renegade apes who are said to have entered and carried off women on several occasions. To make a long story short the Kiowa leadership decided this was unacceptable and put together a group of warriors to hunt down the kidnappers. The searchers did manage to track an ape back to its lair and killed not only it, but an entire family unit. Could the LaFleur County story have its roots in the tale told to Jim King by the Kiowa elder? Is there any truth at all, even the smallest of grains in either tale? I've heard many people put their faith in the LaFleur County version simply due to the name of the unfortunate Joshua LaFleur, and they wouldn't have named the county after him if it wasn't true. I have not been able to find anything saying LaFleur County was named after Joshua LaFleur according to the, the Oklahoma Historical Society's website. The name honors the prominent LaFleur family of the Choctaw Nation. Could Joshua LaFleur have been one of the prominent LaFleur family? It is certainly possible but there does not seem to be any documentation singling out Joshua or his actions as the reason for the naming of the county. Growing up in the woods and going camping, my family and I have our fair share of bizarre and scary stories. This one I just can't seem to wrap my head around, even to this day. My parents own 35 acres of property in the deep Rockies, about two to three hours away from our home. We spent as much time as we could camping there, as we all loved it. It was secluded and beautiful and we had a lot of freedom there as kids. My parents were both experienced campers and backpackers and had both grown up in the mountains. One day we head up at night, arriving at the property at around 9 or 10 pm. We were all tired and start to unpack the tents and such from the car. The minute we get out though, we all get a strange feeling. It didn't feel normal or good. We had encountered wild predators at this point and knew the feeling of being watched. But this was like being watched from all sides. We also all notice that there are no sounds. It is dead silent. Normally we would be hearing all of the insects, and occasional owls, night hawks or bats. And just the general hum of a forest. Nothing. We all kind of laughed nervously and maybe mentioned a few things but got to work setting up our tents nearby. This is when the real strange stuff starts to happen. We begin to hear rustling in the branches around us, about 10 feet off the ground, it seems. It almost sounded like large creatures like monkeys or raccoons, jumping from tree to tree loudly. And many of them. 
I have never ever seen raccoons have the ability to do something like that, and these sounds were clumsy, unlike birds. It gets louder and louder and becomes extremely unnerving. At this point the tent is set up and my parents put my brother and I in there, telling us to stay inside. They go out with flashlights, trying to make sense of this bizarre activity. As they are outside we start to hear these bizarre calls. I have never ever heard anything like this before or since. Honestly it almost sounded like humans mimicking some kind of primate holler or screech. There was an odd human-like aspect to it. And it's like they are calling and responding to each other from every direction, along with the branches cracking and rustling. My parents come back to the tent and tell us they couldn't see anything at all. I remember how shocked and frightened my mom looked, and it scared me because she was a badass that would stalk bears to get a good photo. Both my parents were not easily frightened in nature, or at all. We are all huddled together in the tent, confused, scared and unsure of what to do. The sounds are so loud and everywhere it almost sounds like some crazy storm outside. Our dogs are cowered in between us all, totally freaked out. My dad decides to go out again, and I remember as he finishes unzipping the tent, the sounds stop. Just like that, in an instant. And the oppressive, weird feeling is gone. He and my mom go out again to investigate and again find nothing, except fallen branches and some strange marks up high on some trees. They come back, talk us down and somehow manage to get us to sleep. We still talk about this to this day. None of us know what happened, and have no explanation. Like I said, we had some crazy and strange things happen to us. But never anything remotely similar to what happened that night. I saw a flying manta ray also. It was magical and I rarely talk about it because I don't want anyone to say I'm crazy. It had an electric pulsing blue outline which is the only thing that made it distinguishable from the night sky. Appearing to be swimming but in the sky. It looked as if it swam through a black hole or a time warp or something. It slowly started to disappear as if walking through a door and pieces of its body would be invisible. It was in the fall of 2015 in Great Falls. Montana where Malmstrom Air Force Base is located, above the Missouri River. It was seen between midnight and 3 a.m. but it was well above the height a plane would be flying and was massive. Incredible. It didn't look like it was flying. It looked as if it was underwater swimming based on the way the outline of it moved. It slowly disappeared as if it was going into a portal or something. My encounter was during firearms deer season in the late fall outside of Myersdale, Pennsylvania. My friend and I were hunting on his aunt's property. After we parked we started up a hill that gets very steep. Where the woodbine starts we split up. He goes off to the left and I went all the way to the top of the hill to a deer stand that's in the woods about 40 yards from the field. This was our third day there. As I was climbing up the deer stand I heard a distinct, drawn out whoop. I would estimate 100 yards ahead of me. I decided I didn't want to be a sitting duck in the deer stand so I climbed down and went back into the field where I sat. Once the sun began going down I decided to walk back down the hill. Now inside the woods was pitch black but there was still some light in the field. Once I got to the bottom where the woodbine curves I heard footsteps. I looked up and saw a silhouette walking on the other side of the brush where the woodbine curves. I figured it was my friend who decided to walk up to meet up with me since it was getting dark. I said, hey, did you see any deer? And all of a sudden this thing tore into the woods and made its way up the hill. I know this was no person as it was pitch black in the woods and there was so much debris that there was no way a person could move at the speed this thing was. I clearly could make out the bipedal footsteps. My friend came out of the woods about 60 yards away. I saw his light before I saw him. He said he heard someone walking around and also questioned me about the whoop as he thought it was me who did it. It was then that I introduced him to the Bigfoot world and he said I never thought about all the weird stuff I heard up there until you brought it up. Apparently, he has heard things up there before. Needless to say, we didn't go hunting up there again. A few years back, around the end of May, I was taking my dog out a little after midnight and I saw something fly past me. It was a beautiful, 
glowing blue light that was flashing on and off like a firefly, in the same fashion, getting brighter and then dimming at about the same rate, in the same, organic, gradual beautiful way. It was invisible to me when it wasn't lit up, also like a firefly in the dark. Although it wasn't completely dark, there were street lights and enough environmental light to see everything around me. And instead of being the size of an insect, this was more the size of a bird. It whooshed past me, flying in an organic, imperfect path, and in a hurried way that made me feel strongly that it was some kind of animal, creature or being. It also seemed intelligent somehow, though I can't logically explain why. I had my eyes on it for about 10 seconds straight, so I know I didn't imagine it or mistake something else. It flew right past me and up toward the window where my light was on and I had been working by the window that night. This was an exciting, magical moment for me but I didn't know what to think of it, and pretty much just went about my night and my life. A few nights later, my boyfriend came to stay over, and in the middle of the night, I got up to use the bathroom. From the bathroom window in the dark, I could see a huge, tall tree in the distance, we were on the second floor, that seemed to be full of glowing blue lights that were flashing on and off in that same, firefly pattern. But these were bigger than fireflies. They were blue with a slight green hue mixed in. I called him to the window to look, and we stood watching together and then got back into bed and watched from there for quite a while until we couldn't stay awake anymore. We were both seeing it and we were both in awe and disbelief. This tree was far away, and I very much doubt that anything as small as a firefly would have been so visible or so bright or so big in our field of vision at that distance. They seem to be lighting up in these synchronous patterns. Not all at once but as if in a chain of communication. It would go completely dark at times and then we would see one again, then two then three then ten. There were some flying in the air too, they weren't all in the tree. I never saw these again that spring or summer or since. We are in Middle Tennessee. Not a rural area, but enough space and land around us then that it was a quiet, peaceful place. Have never seen or heard of blue fireflies or anything like that in our area. Wondering if anyone has any thoughts about what these incidents might have been or if anyone has experienced anything similar. On April 9, 2003, the witness said that whatever this creature was it was pure evil. This began when a group of friends decided to go camping and hiking. On the third day of their hike, the witness said they had just started a fire and were cooking dinner when they started to hear something howling off in the distance. He and the rest of the party knew that it wasn't coyotes since these howls were deep and powerful, maybe wolves the witness said. Everyone turned in for the night around 10.30 p.m. knowing that it was going to be a hard hike the next day. When they were all asleep the witness said that they all were woken by a very loud howl and movement in their camp. All seven of the party came out of the tent at about the same time. Two other members had brought handguns with them just in case they did run into a large animal like a bear or, as it seems, a large canine. They couldn't see anything at first but they could hear something very large moving just out of their sight. The witness says that even though they hadn't seen the creature he and the other members of the party could feel an evil presence. You could feel it in the air and it was really freaking everyone out. It was a heaviness like you get when you walk in on people that are fighting but it stops because they don't want anyone to know. A feeling of hate he thought. Everyone else was talking and concerned about the strange feeling. They would hear large stick breaks, but still no sign of the creature. Then came another loud howl which made them jump out of their own skins. At that point, they all were starting to get scared with his two friends having their pistols drawn and ready to fire when one of the group members screamed out saying that she had just seen something huge and it was only on two legs. She was visibly shaking as she was telling what she had just seen. The flashlights were really starting to go to work shining all through the trees. Then from behind them came another loud howl which made the witness chest vibrate he said. Then they could hear it moving once more as if it was hunting them. One of his friends said that this is not good. Everyone needs to get close to the fire and it needs to be built up fast. So they started placing more firewood, eventually giving off a good glow throughout their camp. Now this is when they all say that they saw this creature. The witnesses said it was standing at least seven and a half feet tall with it having a wolf's head. It was silver with white markings while standing on just its hind legs. 
It was only 20 to 25 feet away from them just staring with greenish yellow glowing eyes, which made their blood run cold. It T stood there for a good 15 to 20 seconds just staring with its arms down by its side. It did look like it had hands but was tipped with long claws that looked to be at least two and a half inches. The torso was human-like through its shoulders and chest area, but its belly looked to be sunken. The legs could be seen only above the knees with bushes covering its lower legs. The witness said that this creature is out there, but he doesn't know if it's a werewolf or what. As this creature was standing there the witness friends had their pistols out, starting to fire at the feet of this creature causing it to growl and show its long canine teeth. Then the creature bolted off to the left while making a howling noise once again. The sounds of the limbs and twigs breaking were fading as the creature moved off. They didn't hear the creature for the rest of the night. Regardless, after their encounter, none of the parties were going back to sleep. Before I start, sorry this will be a long one. I should just make a separate post but I'll just leave a comment for now. I've started a post on multiple occasions but tell myself halfway through that people would think I'm bullshitting and delete the post. My dad's side of the family is very strict religious in sort of a cult-like manner. Luckily, my dad and aunts came out kinda normal but my grandparents are very weird. Love y'all lamau. My mom's side of the family is the complete opposite. Both her and her dad have always been sensitive to paranormal shit and both have some wild stories. My grandfather is a very wise wizard-like man with a long track record of psychedelic journeying if you will, and I sort of relate all of our experiences to him. Anyway here's some weird shit that has happened to us. I was born in 2004 and have had paranormal experiences throughout my life. In my first house, I mistook a woman in a dress for my older brother. When I told my parents I saw him leave they told me he was already at school and we were the only ones in the house. My younger brother and I would always see red firefly-like dots dance above us while we were laying in bed. Doors would slam and there would always be noise that couldn't be explained. In 2013 we moved into a new house where my parents saw a dark hunched raccoon-like figure on multiple occasions. There was also a motion activated light in the hallway by my room that would go off by itself around 2 to 3 am on multiple occasions. My sister's room was across the hall and told me that there was a time when she walked past my room and saw me sitting straight up in bed staring right through her eyes. She said she told me to go to sleep and I replied I am sleeping, can you not see that I am sleeping? I never saw the figure that my parents did but one of my older brother's friends saw it crawl up the stairs. F that. We moved again in 2017 into my parents' current house, and this is where we have all had the most intense experiences. First off, their house is in an older neighborhood with a lot of original owners still in their homes. Secondly, the previous owner of the house informed my dad that the next door neighbor hung himself on the back porch a few years prior. Apparently, the man had been hanging there long enough for turkey vultures to be swarming on his body and landing on the neighboring houses. When the body was found, his neck was so stretched that his feet almost reached the ground. This will come into play later. When we first moved into this house, my mom and I would talk about how clean and empty of entities this house felt. This all changed around a year or two after we moved into the house. My sister had her first daughter around this time and lived in an apartment with her boyfriend, now husband. My niece started having violent night terrors and would always tell my sister random aspects of another life she lived with all of her old friends. One weekend, my sister came over and dropped my niece off to spend the night. While she was over, she kept telling us that all of her friends were there with us. I personally believe this entity used my niece to get into our house. Call me crazy because I just might be. Anyway, after my niece made that comment, the house never felt the same. It started out innocent and loving. There were multiple times I would feel a warm presence of my late uncle and even felt him put his hand on my shoulder a couple times. After the good however, there was a small leak of darkness that kept flooding the house. Shadows would move out of the corner of my eye, I would have terrifying nightmares, and always smelled a gross fishy smell in the media room. The strangest part is that for a while my mom and I would both feel cycles of good and bad in the house at the same time. I would make a comment about seeing something and she would look me dead in the eyes terrified telling me she saw the same thing. One time in particular, 
I walked out to the garage to grab a drink and saw a very tall, around 8 feet, slender pitch black figure looking at me behind my mom's car. When I came back in she just saw it on my face and all she said was, I know, they're back, I saw him too. This cycle of clean to evil kept getting stronger and more active in the house. The peak of the darkness happened right at the end of the main COVID lockdown BS. This is when it would visit me in my room at night and F with me all night long. Like clockwork, right around 2 to 3 AM I would experience a crippling feeling of terror and know that it was in the room with me. There would be a visible dark fog like haze that would fill the room like smoke. All outside sounds of bug, animals, or wind would go dead silent. My TV and phone would both disconnect from the Wi-Fi, stop working, and I would be left alone with this being. I would hear knocks moving around my room, the floor creaking like footsteps, and my blinds would get pulled and let go to hit and bounce on my windows. On one occasion, I decided to be a man and rolled over to face whatever was in my room. This is probably one of the scariest things that has ever happened to me. When I rolled over, I saw a figure crouching down by my door. Frozen with fear, I kept staring and watched this figure that was even darker than a pitch black room stand up to a terrifying height and stretch its arms and neck straight up in sort of a dominating threatening position. This thing literally reached the ceiling with the tips of its fingers and head. Around 9 feet tall. I got a pretty good look at the thing and could see it was wearing a black hat and trench coat. I told my parents about this in the morning. My mom believed me but my dad always thought we were crazy and tried to play everything off as us experiencing sleep paralysis or just being crazy. Fast forward to 2022 my parents. Had some friends in town staying at the house. I came downstairs one night while they were hanging out on the couch and my dad called me over. I could tell that they were all sort of on edge and my dad's friend described to me the same thing I saw but walking across the second floor balcony. Fast forward again to January of this year, I had a buddy over and we both took LSD the first time. We were hanging out in the media room, where I used to get that weird fishy smell, and also the closest room in the house to the neighbor that hung himself. When we were both peeking in our own worlds listening to music, he said he opened his eyes and saw and described the exact same figure. Stretched arms and neck, hat and trench coat. The crazy thing is that he didn't bring it up until a couple months later and I had never told him about my experience with it. The weirdest part is that he even told me that it wasn't the acid placing that vision in his head. He felt terrified like this thing was actually looking at him. I haven't had any bad experiences in around 6 months and actually feel really good right now. My dad however had an encounter with Anubis. He remembers waking up and watching Anubis walk out of his bathroom, stand at the foot of his bed, and stare him directly in the eyes. He has always been a skeptic but after that experience he has opened up about other things that have happened in his life that he believes to be paranormal. Anyway Teresa our story. Believe it or don't but to my mom and I it's reality. If y'all got any questions or wanna know more LMK and I'll answer. Two nights ago I had a dream where it was standing looking at me in my room. I don't remember seeing its body just head and horns. The classic representation of a windigo, it was kind of surrounded by a red aura. I remember seeing it and not being scared at all you can even say it was if I had known it for a long time. I should mention I have a pet that sleeps in my room with me, my priority has always been and always will be to protect her from anything including things in my dreams. I remember something among the lines of please not her, the windigo never said anything but also never turned to see her. Its focus was in me, as if it never saw her or it wasn't interested. I'm glad, then I woke up. Usually when I have a nightmare I wake up all scared and in shook, not this time. I don't know what to think. Edit, what I saw was something similar to the first Google image search. I should also mention that it's not the first time I see weird humanoid figures in my dreams, but it always changes forms. First it was a skull-like humanoid, then a coated shadow, then a floating skull and this time is the first time I see a full defined skull with horns. And like I have mentioned before each time it seems like I'm getting more and more comfortable with its presence, as if unconsciously I'm accepting its message, destiny or whatever it bringing for me.
When me and my best friend went up to her cabin in the woods we would go smoke a joint and go for a walk in this dirt pathway near her cabin. While we were walking back we kept hearing footsteps behind us. It was pitch black around us except for the flashlight we had plus the flash on our phones. When we would walk faster we could hear the footsteps move faster. We eventually stopped and looked around to see, and both saw a dark mass shape of a man run behind a tree. We had the lights pointed right at it and it was darker than the night sky around it and had no human features besides the shape of a body. We flipped out and both bolted towards her cabin. It freaked us out the entire weekend. We were driving to work one night and as we drove up the road to exit our area we saw what appeared to be a very sickly pale, like almost white, human-like creature that appeared emaciated, it was moving on all fours and unnaturally fast. Me and my husband both saw it and turned to each other to confirm that we both saw the same thing because we were just completely caught off guard. It ran in the opposite direction from where we had to turn, thank goodness. No idea what kind of cryptid they were but I was hiking once, broad daylight and what can only be described as elves or goblins were in the trees. Barely visible and you would only see a flash of them as they hid behind the trunks and larger branches, but peripherally you could make out hands, faces, and most importantly eyes, constantly watching me as I was hiking. Another, I know what it is by local lore but I dare not say the name in text, but I saw what I'll describe as a skull of a great antlered deer on a long or tall, 8 to 10 feet tall, black humanoid body in the distance. I maintained a great reverence and respect from a distance. I have seen death, Abaddon. When my grandmother died it stood in my room when it was night. My grandmother was a devoted Christian, it was a dark entity standing in from of my door. I woke up and I was in shock. After I calmed down a bit it spoke to me. It said, we lost the battle for the soul of your grandmother. But I'm sure that your soul will be ours. After that it stayed and looked at me. Finally my brain was working enough to say something back. I said, in the name of Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit I command you, leave me, it responded with, ha ha ha, I know him but who are you? Then I replied, again, in the name of the spotless Lamb. By the authority given by blood of Jesus and the words of his testimony, I command you again, leave me. After that it left me alone with a lot of cursing. That was my first experience with the upper natural world. After this I started taking courses to understand the upper natural world and how to fight the demons that are living there. After this I preached for a lot of people the evangelic of Jesus Christ and I witnessed with my own eyes the Holy Spirit do wonderful things but I saw with that I saw more demons visited me. But I can handle it now. I know they can't hurt me as long as I stay close to my faith and repent my sins. Hat man. Outside, across my street in front of a lighted church sign that is 12 feet tall. Had to have been 10 feet. I looked out and saw what looked like a huge man standing there, then he walked behind the sign and disappeared. I got my husband to go check it out, and there were no footprints in the fresh snow. Days prior to this, my husband had a friend over who insists he is followed by a demon and that this demon shows up in pictures taken of him. OFC the group laughed and began taking pictures, the ones that take hundreds every few seconds, and sure enough, in one photo, there was a huge ass dark figure of a man in a tall hat behind him. Only in the one photo. Also, that week, we heard running up and down our steps on two occasions. Then, after I saw the shadow man outside, it ended. My god, that was a couple of years ago, and I'm so scared now that I probably won't sleep thinking about it. Well, I grew up in a haunted house. There was a huge amount of activity regularly, most constantly was noise and things being thrown or moved. It was a very old house that has seen a lot of death both in the home and the surrounding areas, it was an old mining town. Anyways, I would see things thrown across the room, not just fall but thrown so hard that if it was class it would break and flew from one side of the room to the other. There was also this very large black thing, 
You could see the shape but there was no definition but looked human shaped. All I know is that it was always angry and would go out of its way to F with you. My friends wouldn't sleep over anymore because of things that happened there. Like a picture lifting away from the wall but still sitting on the hook like someone grabbed the bottom of it and made it swing back and forth, but it was like it was almost horizontal, it's not something an earthquake could cause without destroying the entire home. Oh and there was an old woman who watched over the children, she was seen by multiple people. She looked like she was in her nightgown and had a sleep cap on. I remember her being kind, but it was still scary. I could go on, there are so many stories. Actually saw a ball lightning as a kid, really close. I was on the right hand of the back seat of our car and looked ahead as we were slightly going uphill on a normal road of some small town. It came straight down towards us, but on the sidewalk, rolling. The insides of it were a wild mix of what some marbles look like inside and the inside of certain jellyfish, all the while shooting short blue rays of electricity in all directions. When it was about where I was, it took a sharp turn away into the yard between houses and I lost sight of it. Later in life, to you f us at once. I was standing awkwardly at my window, wanting to try out my dad's, tobacco, pipe and saw two very bright blinking lights towards the horizon, motionless, and assumed they were stars. This repeated over the next couple hours. They just caught my eye when I went smoking at the window as they were in my direct line of sight. Hours later, I went to smoke once more and as I look at the stars, both of them started taking off, the left one to the left, at the speed of what a regular plane would go, but quickly disappeared behind my window frame. The right one, though, was what convinced me it was actually UFOs. Not only that they stood still all these hours, then both take off at the same time, but the right one was just blasting off, leaving a trail behind. I watched it slack jawed going all the way across the sky. We don't have aircraft that could go at that speed or hover in the same spot for hours on end. I get visits from invisible folks sometimes. I see the air bend around them, it's so bad, it startles me when one steps towards me. I've dodged to the side because of it before. There's smaller ones, too, who love to run all over sofas and stuff, almost like a riled up dog. I suppose the pitch black orb that was sharply flying a curve around my head before it disappeared in the wall was related. Two of them were frolicking through our backyard like giant apes. Actually, I heard M approach loudly from the neighbor's yard, one came swinging through the tree, the other I guess scaled the fence. Then rummaging through our bushes in absolute silence when they came the last few yards towards me. Then the awful feeling as if something sucked on my neck like two fleshy tubes. Around that time, it felt like the entire city was losing its mind. A drinking buddy at the bar was mentioning it too, unrelated, wondering what the heck was happening with people. Guess we'll never know, but I had the weirdest rashes at that time that still bother me after all these years. That was a surreal time 2013-14. A few more things, but I'll leave it at that. When I was younger, about 12 years ago, my little sister and I had bunk beds in our very tiny bedroom in my grandmother's creepy basement. The size of this room can only really be compared to the size of a walk-in closet. I had the top bunk, my sister had the bottom but she hardly ever slept in the room, she would always sleep with my mom in her bedroom next door. I was a scared child so I always slept with the TV on for light and a little bit of sound. One night it was just me in the room, sleeping on my top bunk when I woke up randomly in the middle of the night. The TV had been turned off by someone or something but in the darkness I could clearly see, standing in the middle of this tiny room, only a couple of feet away from me, was a man. I didn't recognize him at all, but he was there, in my room, clear as day. He was a heavier man dressed in a short sleeve floral Hawaiian pattern shirt and a pair of light brown shorts. I remember thinking that was weird because it was the dead of winter in central Utah, no one in their right mind would be dressed like that during that time of year. I stared at him and he stared at me. All of the sudden he started to move his hand across his face and do that thing where he'd change his facial expression every time his hand would pass his face. I watched him, in complete bewilderment myself, as he continued doing this for a few seconds before I shut my eyes tightly and covered myself with my blanket. 
I didn't feel like he was there to hurt me or scare me, but Lord was I terrified just from seeing a stranger in my room in the middle of the night. When I mustered the courage to look out for my blanket again he was gone despite me never hearing the door open or shut or hearing any movement at all. This is not my only paranormal experience, it's just the only one where I actually saw someone. Other times have just been shadows or noises or poltergeist activity. OMG so. Let's start with shapeshifters, which describe everything I'm about to say. First a walking cat-like figure which cloaked in front of me. Then a small white shiny cherub type extraterrestrial. Shadow people coming out of portals. A dark being with a slender body almost the form of an ant's, curviness yet skinny, with large white angelic wings. I've seen people being printed of teleported or light beamed in via things like a large mushroom looking thing, light night zaps and large white light movement, respective order. I've seen triangle helicopters, green super skinny people, dark oblong people, and most of it caught on camera. This is what life is like being named Yadidia, friend of God. Growing up in my old place, I always felt a presence in and around the bathroom. Anywhere else in the house felt fine majority of the time. As a four to five year old I was frequently spooked during the night and got into my parents' bed, for reasons I'm still unclear about. Whenever I'd be laying in my parents' bed, laying there awake, trying to calm down, get comfy, go to sleep, etc. I'd always start watching a cluster of floating orbs gratefully appear out of thin air. Shapes, stars, swirls, squares, triangles, would float in and out of a space, sort of like a galaxy screensaver on a big screen, but without being able to see the device projecting it, so to speak. Lil me would drift off to sleep, never actually seeing it dissipate or travel anywhere because I'd be asleep before that happened. Another time at my grandparents' house, around that same age of four to five, Spending the night w my two older brothers because dad traveled for work and mum did night shifts in a casino safe. I was walking down the hallway to go into the lounge room when I've looked into the smaller spare room, we slept in a larger spare bedroom because that one became storage, and seemed like I don't know, 15 to 20 shadow figures dancing on all four corners of the room. Like tribal ritual type dancing. Never seen it again since. Back at old home. We got the bathroom renovated back in 2019 because needed the upgrade. I was 25 years old. One day during construction, the tradesmen had gone on their lunch break. Two had gone to get McDonald's while the others sat outside and ate, had a cigarette, etc. I was using my sewing machine, working on a project when I felt the need to look up toward the direction of the bathroom. I seen a 7 feet tall shadow figure staring at me. When he realized I clocked him, he casually bent his tall ass through the doorway and back into the bathroom. Knowing it was just me in the house for the next 40-ish minutes, I got up and walked into the bathroom. Surely enough, no one was in there and I could see the tradies smoking out by. Their cars, chatting away. I thought for a second it could have been the main plumber we hired for the job because he's six foot something, but not quite tall enough to need to bend through a doorway. I also didn't hear anyone come inside because the front door was slightly noisy and the heavy steps of steel cap boots would have made that apparent, but there was no noise. When my fiancé and I were lying in my bed, before we moved in together, we were looking out the window. It was about 1 in the morning or so and we were just chatting about the stars. I lived on a farm where there was very little light pollution and the only thing in the distance was cornfields, a couple barns, and if you look really close you could make out the airport. We decided that it was finally time to wind down and go to sleep, but instead of closing our eyes to actually try and fall asleep, we continued to look at the stars but didn't say anything. All of a sudden, I saw a giant, red, fluffy looking fireball in the sky above the airport. I thought my fiancé was asleep so I didn't say anything. I just stared at it. It was moving but completely stationary, like it stayed in one place but it looked like it was sparking? Like a 4th of July sparkler except it was massive and hovering above the airport in the distance. It was so clear. It eventually just disappeared. 
I just lied there motionless with my mouth hanging open trying to work out what I saw, when I hear fiancé whisper did you see that? What the f was that and I flipped over and started geeking out. We spent the next hour talking about it and google searching anything similar. I didn't sleep very well that night. We still bring it up every once in a while, but nothing ever came of it, and it never happened again. For me, it was a spectral dog that hangs around the road that I lived on a few years ago. It's well known to the locals as haunting that end of the road and there are two types of encounters. Either it appears as a warning of an impending accident, and has often prevented a few, or it shows up after the accident has occurred. Typically described as a large shaggy white dog with glowing red eyes, seen at a distance in the nearby farmer's fields. It wasn't so far away from me. Wife and I were driving home from a long day trip into DC and we were both knackered. We were trying our best to keep each other awake. Her talking to keep my mind going, and I talking to her to keep her awake so she could keep me awake. We had turned onto the road and had a mile and a half to go before we were home when my wife screamed look out. Just as I saw something candid, white, large and shaggy run in front of the car. I slammed on the brakes and swerved but it was too close and we were moving too fast to avoid it. I pulled over to look for the dog that I had to have hit and found nothing. No blood, no fur, no injured dog, no damage to the bumper. Nothing. We gave up looking and drive home. The adrenaline surge kept us going until we got home and for an hour passed that before we were ready to finally go to bed told a co-worker about the encounter and that's when she told me about the spectral dog and that I likely ran into that. I've seen and experienced multiple things in my house, as have my grandparents, and so has my mom. When I was younger, around 9 or 10 years old, I had a big closet, and I used to have my office in there. One day, I walked into my room, and my closet door was open with the light on and there was a little blonde girl sitting in the chair with the scariest look on her face. I ran screaming to my parents' room, and my dad ran to my room but saw nothing. When my sister and I were younger, I was around 9 and she was around 6 or 7 at the time, we were sleeping over at our grandparents on a mattress on the living room floor when I felt like something was watching us. I looked over to the opposing wall where the nightlight, the only light source on in the house, and they're on a dead-end road so no cars going by, and I saw a shadow figure walk by clear as day. I got my sister's attention and told her not to make a sound. We watched five more walk by from left to right. She hid under the blanket, and I watched three more walk back from right to left before doing the same thing. There have been many shadow figures. I've had stare downs with two and only had the courage to run at one, where it disappeared into thin air. I've also seen things peeking their heads out around corners and doors, etc. In the same house where I saw the shadow figures walk by, my mom grew up in that house and saw a Native American walk by in the front lawn and disappear behind a tree. Paint cans got launched off a shelf in the basement directly below her room in the middle of the night, waking her up. Her radio or stereo system randomly stopped playing music when she was studying and just said her complete name, then paused and went back to playing music. A ball of gold light entered her room then just disappeared. In our current house, she's seen shadow figures, and I'll mention that I saw a shadow person in the basement last week, and she will say she has too, and what day it was, being the same day I saw it. She woke up the morning after being given an old Native American smoking pipe, we have a lot of antiques, to something crushing her chest and pinning her arms, but she said in the name of Jesus and it immediately went away. She's had many more weird dreams and encounters she says she can't tell me until the right time whatever that means. I think I've forgotten some things, but those are probably the weirdest or most notable ones. Story time. My husband and I were out cross-country skiing. We had just crossed a remote country road, and were about to ski across a field. On the other side of this field, we spotted an extremely large wolf standing just inside of the tree line. I felt uncomfortable as the creature was staring right at us, following our movements. My husband, carrying a 22 rifle on his back on a sling, brought the rifle down, 
chambered a cartridge, and fired into the ground in front of the creature. The creature looked at the ground, then back at us, and began to growl. The growl went up and down in sound, and it was very deep and menacing. My husband shouldered his rifle again, but did not fire. What really gave me the chills was the look on the creature's face. I felt that the creature knew that the rifle was small caliber, and was not something that could kill it with one shot. Moments later, my husband fired again, this time into a tree next to the creature. The creature didn't flinch, but what it did next made both of us flee in terror. About 30 seconds after the second shot, the creature stood up on two legs. One of its front legs arms was against the tree that my husband shot. The growling continued, but it had increased in volume, and the creature was moving its jaws up and down, as if gnashing its teeth. My husband fired three shots directly at the creature, all three hitting it in the chest. The creature let out a drawn-out scream or howl, and ran off into the forest on two legs. We fled the other way back towards our vehicle. As we were skiing back, we had to pass through a small area of the forest. As we were passing through, we could hear something running towards us from a distance through the woods. We cleared the woods without anything happening, but when we broke out of the forest, we estimated that whatever was chasing us was no more than 35-40 yards behind us. I had my cell phone with me, and was thinking about using it to take a picture of the creature. Suddenly, I got a feeling, that if I took a photograph, the creature would kill both of us. The feeling was so strong that I immediately shoved the phone in my pocket. It wasn't as if the creature sent me a psychic message, or anything. It was just a feeling. One thing I must mention, in a hushed, embarrassed voice. When we made it back to our vehicle, I noticed that I had actually peed my pants. I didn't even notice until the adrenaline rush ended. I had been so scared that I lost control of my bladder. I always thought that was, just something from the movies. As a former ranger, I used to work alone near the outside of Big Bend National Park here in Texas. It can be pretty secluded in certain areas. During my time, I can't even begin to tell you how many strange things I saw or heard. But this is one encounter that is still very fresh in my mind. Now, before I go on, I've heard and seen all sorts of incredibly creepy things. I've had my own skinwalker sightings, a Bigfoot sighting, and there are lots of things out there that go bump in the night that many refuse to talk about. If you meet the right people, they are usually willing to open up and speak about it. But you have to be careful, especially when it involves your line of work. It can definitely affect your career, and how you are viewed as a professional. If you're perceived as crazy or being a nut, good luck getting hired anywhere or advancing your career, especially if you tell people that you saw a skinwalker or a Bigfoot. This night though, something happened that I never thought possible. My work partner, another ranger, and I were on duty. We were both driving back from the station when we heard something very odd. It sounded like a woman's scream mixed with the sound of weeping. It was loud, shrill, lasting only a few seconds. The more I think about it, the more my skin crawls. We did not see anything out of the ordinary, just heard the sound. The next day when we checked on our equipment, one of the cameras was not functioning properly. It recorded the sounds that we had heard, but did not capture any kind of visual. Two weeks later, I heard the same sound while I was patrolling, right around 3 in the morning. It was unusually dark when I heard the sound. It instantly sent a chill down my spine, and the immediate feeling of fear gripped me. It was so real and so incredibly bizarre. I thought, what was that? It sounded like it came from a woman but not. I was alone this time and I certainly didn't want to be, not after hearing that. But the only thing I could do was call for backup. At that hour, I would have brought the fear of God to anybody who came out there with me. It sounded like somebody screaming. I mean, I'm not crazy. I know what I heard. I just can't explain it. I'm here to tell you that many people would write this off and just say, 
Oh, you heard a mountain lion. That's not what this sounded like. I've heard mountain lion and cougar on multiple occasions, and while they can sound like a woman screaming bloody murder, that's not what this sounded like. The tone was audibly deeper, and it just sounded different. I obviously wouldn't have been so terrified if it had sounded exactly like that of a cougar. Now, this would happen again for the few following nights. Each and every time, it would make my skin literally crawl. After what I believed to be about three weeks after the initial audible noises that I first heard, my partner and I were working together again, patrolling the same area at the same time. We both see movement off in the distance in the same direction that we'd heard the screams the first few times. My partner was actually the first one to see it and point out the dark figure moving in the distance. I had to squint my eyes and realize that what we were seeing is a creature moving with its mouth wide open, as though it was screaming. We watched it as it moved very quickly to the desert underbrush. The movement from this creature was as if it had glided towards the underbrush, and not typically run like a quadrupedal animal would. The only reason why we didn't immediately panic was that what we were seeing was just so outrageously bizarre that for the first few seconds, we couldn't handle what we were seeing. Neither of us screamed, and we didn't run like it was some kind of monster ghost, but we did eventually hightail it out of there. I think we were just so shocked and stunned. I'm not saying that I know what this creature is that we saw there in Big Bend National Park, but judging by its physical appearance, it reminded me of what many people claim to be a ghoul. Ghouls are similar to crawlers or rakes in that they are all white and have very wide open mouths. I only know these things because I decided to do a little bit of research into cryptozoology after the sighting to try and educate myself on what it is that I saw. The main reason being I wanted to know if these things are dangerous or pose a threat. From everything I've read, they definitely do. I can't prove it was a ghoul, but based on everything that I saw and experienced, things all point to that. I don't want to just write this off as nothing because nothing will never terrify me as personally as this did. I've been having nightmares about it pretty much non-stop. I figured sharing my experience with the world is probably the best thing I can do. After all, this is not something that you hear about every day, but I know I did not want to go back there. I'm planning on making an official report eventually for the National Park Service, but we wanted to get more information out there from users. This is one of the many things that has happened over the course of my career. Feel free to ask questions. It was 2.30 am, and another night of not being able to sleep due to back pain. I was lying on my side, reading, when my very close by neighbor's motion detector light turned on. This happens from time to time. When it turns on, it lights up the entire side of my house. We have lived here for nine years, and I have never once seen anything walk past my bedroom window at night. Since I was facing my large bedroom window, the very bright motion detector light going off caught my attention. I looked up and saw the side silhouette of a dogman, I said. Holy crap, it was walking past my bedroom window. I saw it from mid shoulders up. The shoulders were huge, and its head was huge. It had pointed ears, like a German shepherd dog, and a long snout. Its mouth was slightly open, as I saw a large tongue that seemed to be lolling to the side of its mouth. When I saw this creature and spoke those words, I could swear that thing slowed down, smirked, and then kept going. That's all I saw that night. Last week though, while in my bedroom again, I heard something huge land on the ground behind my bedroom wall. That wall has no windows. I heard deep, kind of raspy breathing. I started praying, pleading the blood of Jesus over my house, the grounds around it, and all. I do this most nights, but sometimes I forget. I'm awake most nights until 3 a.m. or later due to having severe spine issues, as well as fibromyalgia. We live in a lovely manufactured home community. There are lots of trees around here, and it's very close to canals, large open fields, and woods. 
I know this is what I saw, but the fact that I saw it has left me amazed. Why is that when so many are also seeing them? I guess I just thought since I am in the house most of the time due to my health, I would never see them. The space between my neighbor's house and ours is about 10 feet. My husband went outside weeks later once I got the courage to tell him this had happened, and measured the area by the window. That dogman had to be at least 8 feet tall. What concerns me greatly is that no one in the police department or government will alert people to their existence. People are walking around feeling a false sense of security. I know I did. I won't even try to walk outside anymore, and yes, I have cautioned my neighbors the ones with the security light. I can't think of any other details right now, but it's important for you to know that several years ago, a homeless woman was camping out down by the river here in Albany. She was found dead, and her tent was really torn up. I believe the police report in the newspaper said she was torn up as well, but I honestly can't remember any of the details. To the best of my knowledge, no one was ever caught for that crime. This is a sleepy town, just over 50,000 people. We no longer get the newspaper, so I have no idea if this has happened again. I do know that a couple was down by that same area and saw a dogman. It really frightened them badly. About three years ago, I encountered what I could only explain then as a deformed hyena. It was in the later part of the day under dusky conditions, and I was small game hunting at the time. I did not feel any fear because I was carrying my over under shotgun at this time. Its eyes were kind of strange, and I remember it had very pointy ears. Its head was almost cartoon-like as its snout had messed up overgrown hair. Its fangs looked unusually long too. For some time before I seen it, I heard a very very long coughing noise, like a cat coughing up a fur ball. However this went on for a long time, so whatever did it had strong and large lung capacity. I doubt a lynx or cat could have been the noise maker. I have no idea if this dog-like creature was the source of this strange and long coughing fit. Another strange thing along this trail. I always seem to be under the watchful eyes of a high-flying turkey vulture. Now these are newcomers to Alberta, but a few mating pairs have been reported up here, and this is common local knowledge that no one questions. This coughing bout I have heard at least onth before in this specific area. Never seen the source in the nearby dense boreal forest. This wooded area is kind of on the edge of oil exploration, and is an active work area now so I don't hunt there anymore. Which is too bad as it's chock full of small game such as rabbits and grouse. During this encounter the woods were unnaturally quiet, it's hard to move in many areas off trail because the evergreen limbs reach so far close to the ground an upright person would be stooped over to move at any kind of speed in many areas. Quadrapes have a definite advantage here over people and the area is also ringed with swamps and marshy very uneven goron that one could easily turn your ankle on. There were other strange moments then, I think when I did see this animal, I sat down on a large rock with my gun across my lap, and caught the first glimpse, as it was circling me I think to catch my scent on the wind. I just caught a glimpse of it passing behind a tree in the dusky light conditions. It had hawks like a dog. But as it came around the tree, still on all four legs I noticed the front legs were longer than the back legs, its back bowed upward, and I got the distinct impression its frontal back, chest and leg muscles were much more pronounced and muscular than its back legs. I believe the front coat was a lighter color with some reddish tones too. Looked like a hyena loose in North America to my own eyes. It w is not a black bear. I am very familiar with bears. It was canine-like, but not any canine I have ever seen before or since. My brother he was not there found a near-perfect picture of another critter online, on another crypto site, and the picture was said to be taken very near the Wisconsin River. In the picture it looked like it was on farmland corral or fence line, in the early spring because of white and light snow cover. 
was the near twin to what I saw that fall evening in Alberta. My encounter took place many years ago. I never had the faintest explanation for it until a couple months ago, when I randomly stumbled across Dogman on the internet. I was in my early 20s, working swing shifts at the time and commuting about 100 miles each way, so it was usually around 2 as in the morning by the time I got home. I saw the monster as I called it on the northernmost section of Trunk Road in the Matanuska Valley in Alaska. This area is roughly smack in between the towns of Palmer and Wasilla. I was only about 10 miles from home at that point, so it must have been around 2 am. Trunk Road is a narrow, two-lane road, consisting of nothing but twists and turns. The surrounding terrain is somewhat swampy and thick with black spruce. It was late October, days before Halloween. There was no snow on the ground, but it was cold enough to be wary of ice. I was driving an 82 Subaru SW, going about 20 miles per hour around a curve, when my headlights caught a large, dark figure up ahead. I'm bad at judging distance, maybe six car lengths away. I instinctively let off the gas, coasting closer. At first I assumed it was a moose, as the area is infested with them. But no, it was standing upright. Bear then. No, not a bear. It looked so strange. Tall enough to be an uncommonly large bear, but far too slender, and it looked like it had spikes running down its neck and back. A Halloween prop. Odd but effective place for one. All those thoughts ran through my head in a fraction of a second. The car was still coasting closer, and I could see more details. It was standing in profile, gazing across the road. I could clearly see its wolfish muzzle, large, upright ears. The spikes on its back were in fact clumps of fur. Its spine curved in a smooth, very natural looking way. It was standing in the ditch, inches from the pavement. Because I was focused on its upper body, I do not recall anything about its back legs, or if it had a tail. I did see its front legs though. Very doggy looking hanging awkwardly down and slightly toward its front, exactly as you'd expect if a dog stood upright. While it clearly had a canine look, there was still something off about it that I cannot articulate. It was perfectly still, and at this point, given the proximity to Halloween, I was quite convinced it was some sort of Halloween prop, because it was clearly not any kind of existing animal. I was deeply impressed and gently stepped on the brakes, intending to stop and examine it closely. Then it turned its head towards me. In the tiny fraction of a second that it took for it to swivel its head, I knew I had made a terrible mistake. The fluidness of its movement removed any and all doubt that this was some kind of prop. It was horribly, terrifyingly alive. The pale, off-white glow of its eyeshine in the headlights destroyed any possibility of a human in a costume. I think I sat there gaping at it in shock for a few seconds, the car barely moving by now, but still inching closer. As I was almost upon it, I think it could have leaned forward and touched the car if it had wanted I had to look up to see its face. Again I'm a bad judge of such things, but I am 5 foot 4. And it was a hell of a lot taller than me. Tall like a polar bear standing. 7 feet, 8. I really can't say. I snapped out of my trance and slammed on the gas. The car fishtailed and I prepared myself for death by monster, as I was certain I'd end up in the ditch. But the tires caught the pavement, and I drove like a complete maniac all the way home. I did not look back. I have only been on that section of road a few times since, never alone and never in the dark. For the next several years of driving that commute, I went 20 plus miles out of the way to avoid Trunk Road. The thing never made any aggressive moves, but there was something about it that felt very, I don't know, predatory. I never saw anything remotely like it again, and never heard any stories about it in the area. I just wanted to share an incident that I experienced in Point Pleasant. West Virginia where I went to high school. I was in a video production class right around the time, 
the movie The Mothman Prophecies with Richard Gere was being made. So we decided to make a documentary. We spoke to a woman in her 70s who, during the time of the original sightings back in the 1960s, said that she was out riding her horse one day, and she said she suddenly felt someone sit down behind her. All of a sudden the horse bucked her off and went crazy. She chased the horse down, and then looked at the horse. Burned into the flesh of the horse were the legs of a humanoid. She immediately got in contact with a veterinarian, who came to their farm to treat the horse. The veterinarian never asked how the horse got burned, as if he had seen this type of burn before. Other than the burn, the horse was fine. Later that week, she confided to a friend that whatever it was that sat behind her on the horse had very thin, insect-like legs. She also said that it had the odor of ammonia. She also said that when she was backed off the horse she caught a glimpse of the being on the horse. She saw huge butterfly-like wings that were yellow in color. She swears up and down that this was the Mothman. Also, it turns out that the veterinarian was one of the 46 victims who died during the Silver Bridge collapse on December 15, 1967. I just thought that was an interesting story. Let me preface this letter with a quick description of my background. I am a retired military veteran with three decades of active duty serving my country and its citizens. I've been honored and privileged to be in command on many occasions during my career, and have seen both the bounty of peaceful time, and the horror of all-out war. You name it I've probably seen it and been through it in the S military. I do not write this to impress, I merely wish to state the facts so that you may judge the accuracy of what I'm about to tell you. So now, the facts as I know them to be my first face-to-face -face encounter with Dogman. It was five years ago in 2019, and there have been more since then my first dogman experience took place in the western United States. I have a cabin in a national forest which is nestled in a beautiful valley located 50 miles up a dirt road at a fairly high elevation, and is only accessible from late spring to late fall depending on how early or late the snowfall is each year. Most years it is impossible to get to the cabin from Thanksgiving through Labor Day due to heavy snow and ice on the dirt road that runs up to that part of the National Forest. But four years ago in January, there was no snow, and since it is rare to be able to go there at that time of year, a friend and I decided to risk it and go up for New Year and planned on staying a week or so. We decided that if snow started falling while we were there, we'd retreat from it quickly and drive out in time before the road became impassable and safely make it down the mountain. We launched from the city, got to the cabin around midday, and found there were a few inches of snow on the ground around it. Ever alert for animal tracks and prints I examined the snow for them I found bear, deer, cougar prints, and something else I was unfamiliar with and had never seen before. I now know that they were dogman tracks. Not knowing what the dogman track were at the time I first saw them, I filed them away in my mind as a new experience and a new bit of data. Then my friend and I began powering up and commissioning the cabin, turning on the power and the water and the gas. The cabin has living quarters on one side and a huge garage with two huge aircraft style hangar doors to slide open. I unlocked and opened the hangar doors about six feet wide. Then my friend and I began unloading the supplies from my jeep parked in the carport, and took them through the hangar and into the cabin proper. As the afternoon progressed we settled in, restocked the cabin supplies, and cleaned a bit here and there. I never go unarmed into that wilderness, so one of the first things I like to do when I get to the cabin is to lay out whatever weapons I have brought with me on a big table out in the hangar. I did this and checked and loaded all the weapons. I also turned on and stocked the gas-powered refrigerator which I keep out in the hangar with some of the food I had brought that needed to be kept cool. Then I returned inside the cabin proper and settled in for an adult libation and an afternoon and bowl session with my friend. After a bit of telling stories between ourselves, 
I noticed the sun had set behind the mountains, and it was beginning to get dark outside. It was time to begin prepping for dinner. I told my friend I would get some steaks out of the fridge in the hangar and went to do so. That's when something completely unexpected happened. As I walked through the door from the cabin into the hangar, I took one, two, three steps and froze. I was being sighted by something outside. It was staring at me through the open hangar doors with murderous intent. In that split second, all the hair on the back of my neck and arms stood straight up, and I started getting what I call my gut warning. I've only gotten those before when flying into live fire from the ground, or when in other combat situations in wartime. Yet, here I was in the middle of the American wilderness getting the very same well-known sensation stronger than ever. I was pretty certain that it was not a human. I didn't freeze but my brain began racing. Instead of walking to the fridge I quickly went over to the weapons table, picked up a large gauge handgun, checked if it was loaded, and stuck it in my belt. Then I picked up one of the already loaded rifles. Once armed I then advanced towards the open hangar doors with the rifle in my hands. I got to the open hangar doors I raised the rifle and started appraising the situation through its scope, swinging it to the left and to the right. It was so dark by then that I could see little but vague tree shapes and the blobs of bushes outside in the forest. Then suddenly, as I swung the rifle to the right, the feeling of being intently watched switched off like flipping a light switch off. I stood there for a bit waiting for the tingle of my intuitive gut warning sign to reappear. After a little while the feeling of being watched didn't return, so I closed and locked the hangar doors, grabbed some dinner steaks from the fridge, and went back inside. Later that night after dinner and KP duty, I armed myself, opened the cabin door, and stood in the doorway. As soon as I did the feeling of being watched started up again, only not as intense as the first time. I stood there for a while, and then once again the feeling of being watched switched off like a switch. The rest of the evening I turned the sequence of events around and around in my head, but could not make any sense of this creature. It just didn't add up. Could it have been a murderous bear that had gotten a taste for, long pig human flesh? All of these thoughts and more went through my mind as I sat there gazing at the wood stove fire in front of me inside the cabin and eventually, I gave up obsessing about it. I told my friend we should hit our racks so we turned in and slept straight through the night with no further incidents. You're probably asking why I didn't leave the cabin the next day. All I can say is that I am perhaps a little too stubborn and have never believed in retreat of any kind. To me, that is paying for the same ground twice, and you have to remember that I've been going to my cabin for 20 years now and have never experienced anything like being watched or hunted. Not ever, not even close. The next morning we did the usual shower and shave routine, and while having a cup of coffee outside in the carport, the feeling of being watched returned, only it was weaker, as if it was from a distance. As the feeling of being watched returned, I still couldn't make heads or tails of the situation I found myself in, but I was adapting as fast as I could. So, I told my friend we would be staying close to the cabin for the duration of our stay. I didn't want to take any chances with this new unknown threat, so I told my friend that I was concerned about bears in the area. My friend took this at face value and agreed to stay close to the cabin and its immediate grounds for the duration of our stay. In the days that followed, I got the sensation of being watched from time to time during the day, but it was always weak and seemed to be from far away. But every time I opened the cabin door at night, and stood there looking out into the night, the feeling returned very strong and very close, like it was that very first night inside the partially open hangar doors. I forgot to mention that I have a pair of Generation 3 military night vision goggles, I use these every night when standing at the cabin door looking for whatever was outside watching us. Each and every time I put the goggles on the feeling of being watched switched off as I explained earlier. This whole situation was darn peculiar, and I just couldn't explain any of it in a rational way that made sense. All I knew was my training from the past, 
and that if I stuck to that, then my friend, and I would be okay. If I developed a plan for the day I felt it would be alright, and after all, we had plenty of weapons and food. The procedure I settled on was simple. Don't go outside at night, don't leave any doors open, and stay very close to the cabin at all times. Most of the time we sat in the carport on folding camping chairs just shooting the breeze. Also, keep yourself armed and have extra firearms close at hand, and most important, never ever go anywhere alone. By midweek, after being at the cabin for four days, we began to get used to this watcher, because it too was following a set of rules and never came into sight. It stayed a certain distance from the cabin. It made absolutely no noise at any time at night. It came closer and stared at the cabin and waited for me to open the door and look around. As soon as I used the night vision goggles, it took off and so forth and so on. On the fourth day at the cabin, my friend insisted on going on a hike. I sensed that I would have the opportunity to figure out who the watcher was. I was using my friend as bait for what I was mentally calling the watcher but I really wanted to know what this thing was. I figured my friend would be safe with me well armed and watching them from a distance. So we agreed that he would hike down the dirt road for a short distance and then come back. My friend got ready to go, excited to get away from the cabin for a spell. I armed myself well. I holstered and put a large bore revolver on each hip. I double checked the load on my R15 and slung it in front of me. Then, at the last moment, I don't know why, I slung my old trusty full auto machine gun on my back. It is what you might call the spoils of war, and has never failed me in the past. My friend was ready to launch down the road, and I was just as ready to watch him do so. He took off and I watched as he walked down the cabin access road to the main dirt road. As soon as he was out of sight, I jogged over to a knoll that had a commanding view of the road, and the entire valley and worked my way into some old growth bushes. From there I watched as my friend started going down the road, and within an instant, I saw something else just off the road behind my friend. It was big and black and stood upright on two legs, and it was fast. It had a weird flippy floppy zigzagging gait, but it zipped from tree to tree incredibly fast, following my friend as he walked down the road. In an instant, I knew that this thing was the watcher that had been spying and watching us all week, and it was not a bear. I raised my rifle and tried to see it through the scope. My first glimpse of it was its head and upper body. It had the head of a dog. I swear it had the head of a huge dog. A little stunned I suddenly remembered my training and lowered my rifle sight to its legs. I saw huge muscular legs like those you would see on an Olympic heavyweight lifter. Its short dense black fur became sparse going down to its feet, and those toes had huge curved talons, not nails. They weren't quite as big as the velociraptor dinosaur talons from the Jurassic Park movies that everyone in the western world has seen, but they were almost as big, and they looked incredibly lethal, like overkill, lethal in a split second. I took this all in. Then I pulled the rifle back up to sight on its head and chest and it was staring back at me, staring directly at me from about 100 yards away. I got a good look as it stared at me. It had a huge head, I would say much bigger than a human. It had short smooth black fur and a huge jaw that was slightly parted. I saw large white canine teeth in its mouth. Its eyes were deep dark red, and as I watched, it started to squint its eyes and really got a good look at me. The longer I looked at it, and it looked back at me my brain tried to compare it to other dogs I've seen in my life. To me, its head looked like a cross between a German Shepherd and a Black Lab. But it was huge, absolutely huge. I got the sense that this thing was mean and pissed off. I instinctively decided to shoot it. Just as I put my finger on the trigger of my R, and was about to pull it, I was interrupted by the noise of a vehicle coming up the dirt road in the distance. I stopped sitting on the beast for an instant and looked down the road, and then I swung my gaze back to the beast. It was gone. I lowered my rifle and scanned for it, 
and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was running away, faster than anything I've ever seen run. It ran through the trees so fast it was a blur, and was running on two legs. Then it burst out of the tree line, and went to all four limbs, and actually increased its speed. It started going through a boulder field, and then took off upslope at such a terrific speed that I remember saying to myself out loud, you've got to be kidding me, nothing runs that fast. I watched as it got to the steep granite mountainside across the valley, and it just went straight up it, seemingly floating over the rock, it was so fast, and it was gone in seconds. I tried to process what I had seen. As the vehicle came up the road, it was a US Forest Service Jeep with a ranger inside making his rounds for the week. The ranger stopped and talked to my friend down in the road, and I watched as they chatted away. Eventually, my friend finished talking to the ranger, then he started up his jeep and drove off. My friend started hiking back to the cabin. When my friend returned to the cabin, it was late in the day, and I told them we'd be leaving the next day. Obviously, I walked around outside the cabin heavily armed after that. A little while later I noticed the ranger in his jeep parked down at my access road gate. I walked down there to chat as I've known that guy for about the past 10 years. We talked about nothing for a few moments, and then I said, Hey, have you ever seen or heard reports of a huge dog running around these parts? The guy looked at me oddly and very coldly said, We don't talk about that stuff. Without another word, he started his jeep and drove off as I was in the middle of saying, What do you mean? What aren't you saying? What's going on? I looked back up the road thinking to myself what the heck is going on up here. It's never been like this before and so forth. I walked back to the cabin. I couldn't get the image of that dog face with the red eyes out of my head that night inside the safety of the cabin. My friend chattered on about how good the hike was while I listened absentmindedly, I replayed over and over in my head, the events of that day. My mind kept returning to the image I had seen in my rifle scope, and began filling in details that I hadn't noticed in the heat of the moment of that first real look at the creature. I finally got a few hours of sleep and slept in a bit. The next morning I woke happy to see the daylight, and thinking for the first time in my life, that I'd be glad to leave the cabin that day. But little did I know our last day at the cabin would turn out to be the strangest one of all. In the mid-1980s, I was told about an encounter that occurred not too far from State College, Pennsylvania Center County. A 19-year-old local resident happened to be looking out his bedroom window, which provided an excellent view of a pasture just west of his house. It was early morning about 6.30 a.m. local time, but there was plenty of light to see clearly. He was in the process of getting ready for work. When he looked out the window, he noticed a tall, hairy creature walking in the pasture, coming from the north. The creature was taking long smooth strides, and its arms moved back and forth as a human would. It did not appear to have a neck, but was capable of turning its head, as it was constantly looking around. Except for the face, the creature was covered entirely with brown or black medium-length hair. The witness was able to see the face and noticed that the forehead protruded distinctly. Also, it appeared the nose was wide and pushed close to the face. The height was approximately 8 feet. As the witness observed, the creature continued walking until it was south of the house. Suddenly, the creature stopped walking when the witness noticed two other similar creatures join it. Both were about about a foot shorter than the first. At this point, one of the creatures reached down and picked up a piece of lumber that was part of a new shed being built. The larger creature started walking swiftly towards the house until it was within 50 feet of the residence. It stopped suddenly, made a few loud grunting sounds, and glared toward the window from where the witness was watching. The witness ducked and crawled to the far end of the bedroom. After a few minutes, the witness got up and looked out the window. The creatures were gone. Later that day, the witness and a friend discovered large, unusual tracks in the pasture. 
It's not known if this incident was ever reported, but I do know that at least one local police officer knew what had happened and confirmed it with me. He seemed to be convinced that the witness was upstanding and honest, but very private. The witness did move away from the area, not long after the encounter fearing that the creatures would harm him. You know that Indian folklore in part tells the truth. I'll explain. Back in December 2001 to be exact, I went on a cruise to the Caribbean. It was a Royal Caribbean cruise. On our third or fourth day, we landed in Puerto Rico. One hour into port, a group of 10 of us got a tour guide for just about an hour. Well, the tour guide was explaining spots of interest on the island. But since it was like a rainy overcast day, he said that it wouldn't be possible to visit those sites. He took us to the beach in San Juan. We all got out, the sun was out just for like 20 minutes. I was married to my ex-wife at the time, and I was taking pictures of her just a couple feet from our tour bus. Well, I saw the clouds coming in, the cloud was shaped almost like an arrow, and at the tip of the arrow were two giant birds. They both had white rings on their necks, one was way larger, and the other one was about the size of a Cessna propeller airplane. I yelled to the tour guide to look up at the clouds and repeated to all the members to look up. But by that time, the two giant birds went straight up higher than the clouds. Then the rain came down and we quickly got into the bus. Nobody believed me. I took pictures of the cloud. I still have them but the birds weren't in the view. Indian legend says these birds bring rain clouds to villages that are in need of rain for planting their harvest. In a way the Indians were right. I live in North Carolina, Durham specifically. My family lives in a standard two-story house in the middle of a run-of-the-mill neighborhood lots of intersecting roads etc. On the night of the question, my family was going to visit a relative who had given birth recently in Greensboro, so I had the house to myself. I was getting home at around 8-9 pm and decided to bring my dog in. She stays outside in the kennel for the day until we bring her in for the night. Our house has a garage attached to the left of it, and the garage has a back door that leads into the backyard. Her kennel is just to your right as you exit the door, with a 4-5 or five feet clearance or path between it and the garage there is also a bed of rock just up against the house, which will be important. She had recently been taken to the vet for her distressed behavior, which is why I had to stay home to be with her. The evening went fine, I watched a movie to pass the time. I then took her out to use the bathroom before being put up for the night, around 12-1. I took her out the back garage door with her long leash, I was wearing socks and didn't feel like getting them soaked. She usually does her business in that little clearing between the kennel and garage, so I let her walk through it. Our garage has a single light on the back wall, not LED or really bright so I can see her somewhat well while she does it. She's facing me when suddenly her backside lifts almost one or two feet into the air. I assumed some wild dog or something had tried to drag her. She runs back to me and I hear rustling among the rocks, and this figure stops right as it enters visible view in the light. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was tall. I'm six foot two and I had to look slightly up to see where I thought its head was. It was pale but not white or grey, just a normal pale flesh color like someone who spends a week or two indoors. It was lanky, not really anorexic or anything but definitely disproportionate. It looked at me for a good 1-2 seconds before it backtracked in the quickest manner I could ever replicate. As soon as it went I booked it back inside. I was torn about calling the police if neighbors who had heard my scream hadn't. Behold almost half an hour later, the police arrive in my driveway, I told them that I had seen a man in the backyard leaving out the whole tall demon crap going on. I have been contemplating whether it was some creature or some NBA-bound nude meth head. Once again, 
I don't count myself as a believer in the Bigfoot or Mothman, but I really don't know WTF happened. I'm most definitely not taking the dog out alone anytime soon. What the hell is was thing? Why was it in a suburban neighborhood? Should I bother telling my family when they get back? I was driving up to visit my dad in Clear Lake, California. I was on a route that took Highway 20 which winds through hills and rocks that sidles along Cache Creek in some spots and goes through Indian Reservation. I left really early in the morning to try and get to his place around 6 am. I hadn't seen him in some years, had never been up to his place there, and wanted to go fishing with him, his retirement pastime. So I'm rolling along about 3 am, it's dark as f out there, and I come around a turn onto a straight section of the road. I can see down the road far enough to see the next bend, and across the road looks like there's a parking lot. I can see the silhouette of cars parked on the opposite side of road, but as I approach something seems off. It looked like there were 15-20 cars parked randomly around the dirt between the road and the drop down to the creek, and at least a dozen or more people just kind of standing around. Not all together, not really in groups of more than two randomly dispersed around the cars. No fire, no flashlights, no headlights, no interior lights. It was like they were in stasis until I got closer. I could see heads turning my way and one of the people starts running toward the road as I approach the corner trying to wave me down. Nope. I gassed around the turn and left them in my tail lights. I've come to understand that there are outfitters that lead rafting trips down the creek, but at the time of year in question, it's too low for that. Debutief were all of those people doing standing around in the dark, why would they need to flag down some rando in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night? It just had bad vibes all around, and my instincts have served me well over the years, so that as they say is that. Lived in eastern Kentucky all my life, a cousin and I were out just walking through the hills when she took a step her leg fell through an old wooden box, and when we started looking around there where rocks standing up in rows we kept looking, and there was an old bigger rock someone had scraped the words only little ones buried here it was an old graveyard of all kids. Our family owned the land for almost 80 years, and no one knew it was there. Of course when we told it they all went to look. Then one day me and my same cousin, and a neighborhood kid went out again, we found a small cave, nothing unusual about that in the hills, but it had old chains bolted to it with some kind of old rusty cuffs. Like for people there were also old rusty cans and a pot way up a mountainside. I've always wondered why they were there and who was chained up. Quick stop after snowboarding at Snowbowl in Flagstaff, Arizona, one early evening in winter. Not dark yet, but nearing sunset. Found what we thought was a secluded and romantic place before my partner, and I would be going out separate ways for a couple weeks. Pulled off on a forest road right off the mountain, walked a short distance and noticed I was not alone. There were dead animals littered on the ground next to me. Not just any though, they were all babies. Different species as well, foxes, javelina, coyotes. I tell my partner who then sees more dead animals over where he is about 20 feet away. We realized they were everywhere. We felt extremely sickened and got out of there fast. This has been about 8 years back, but it was clear none of them were used for their meat, and all were destroyed, bellies cut open, weird stuff. Honestly it was so disturbing, I did not want to look closely. Did report to game and fish non-emergency and never heard anything back. In the middle of the hills. Riding my horse through the hills my horse started snorting. I smelled a back smell, but my nose was runny anyways from allergies. My horse kept stopping and wanting to turn back. I had to go forward or I could not get to where I was going. We got to a big rut like where a stream once was, 
and there was a big tarp with cinder blocks on top of it. My horse was so nervous he rushed past it real quick jumping over it. I turned around to look and saw an arm. This was before cell phones. Rode home fast as I could and told my mom. The cops came and I had to show them where it was. Long story short, turned out to be a hooker. They figured she had only been there a day or two. My friend and I trespassed into the old and abandoned train station in our town. It was a huge abandoned complex with a three-story office building on one side and the giant wooden and concrete station on the other side with three four stories. This place had been abandoned for 20 plus years at least. We already knew that within the last 5-10 years, someone had been cooking meth in part of the building and a fire broke out. So one end was pretty burned down. We came in at the second story of the station to see the roof and floor caving in to the first level from the fire. As we continued on the daylight was no longer reaching the interior of the building, so we turned our torches on. We saw proof of a homeless population living there, but no one was around. We kept on through the building trying to get to the other side, where there was more natural light that would lead out toward the office building. Okay so the creepiest thing I remember seeing in this very old, very abandoned and filthy place was all in one room in the middle of the station. The ceilings had to be 15 feet high or more, and on one end of the wall in one cavernous room were cages. These cages or cells were as tall as the ceiling. One cell could easily fit an elephant I swear. But these cells were immaculately clean. The metal wasn't tarnished or rusting, and there was even brand new wooden boards along the top and bottom of these cells that looked like they had just been installed. There was nothing in any of the cages. We left the station and went to the office building, where we found two dudes stripping copper from the walls. It was unnerving because we were two girls in our early 20s but neither party said a word, and that's when we left. In college, my girlfriend at the time, and I needed to find an apartment for only one semester, which was impossible to find affordably in a college town. We ended up looking on Craigslist and living in a 2BR with this guy, let's call him Dirty Dan. Dirty Dan was in his early 30s, he was pretty much a stereotype nerd. Really tall and chubby, a gross beard and really long gross hair, loved dungeons and dragons and video games and stuff like that. But he seemed nice, and he had a fully furnished apartment, and the rent was low. Dirty Dan became a terror to us. Here are some of his traits. His nice demeanor turned out to be the stereotype, nice guy behavior. He was low-key an asshole, and thought that acting polite entitled him to female attention. He didn't go to school or work, because he received social security for some undisclosed medical problem. Which meant he never left the house ever. Which would be one thing, but... He never left the living room, despite having his own large bedroom. He spent all of his time in there including constantly falling asleep on the couch for hours and snoring. We basically could not use the living room, unless we wanted to hang out with him, which we didn't, because he drove us crazy. When we had friends over and did use the living room, he would just sit there awkwardly and silently on his computer, while we were hanging out or watching a movie with them. Then he would try to watch Let's Play videos on his laptop with the volume up, and no headphones while we were all there. Or he would fall asleep while we were all watching a movie and snore. He also only laid down, never sat up, so he always took up half the couch. He would invite himself to things we were doing, like we would be leaving to go somewhere, and he would just leave with us and invite himself. He got into some polyamorous relationship with two incredibly annoying girls, they would always be over in the living room too, and they spent most of their time discussing their sex life loudly, or looking at BDSMP on his Wii internet browser. He acted super creepy to any female friend we brought over, 
and as soon as they left would try to friend them on Facebook, and hit on them. He would drink all of our alcohol. He was super passive aggressive, bitchy and paranoid. He became convinced that we were legitimately going to try and steal his cats, after we made a passing joke about it. He was totally filthy. Wore the same like, thermal man leggings and t-shirt every day, the bathroom and fridge were disgusting when we moved in, and if we didn't diligently clean them, he would let them become disgusting again. We grew to basically spend all our time in the apartment in our room, and absolutely hate having to interact with him. He had no social graces at all, and was passive aggressive bitchy, and I heard more about his mountain troll sex life than anyone should. Kill Dirty Dan. had just bought an old house, needed some roommates to help pay the bills. It was pre-GFC, and I doubt the bank would have lent me 300k plus on a 35k salary today. The few people who responded included a girl who wanted to know where she could put her five wardrobes, and another girl who wanted to know what equestrian facilities I was offering. Even though I kept telling her that it's only equine link, was that there were horses in a paddock on the other side of the road. Okay, but do you have an arena? How many seats does it have? Eventually I was forced to lower my already very low standards, and took on some very sub-par housemates. Housemate 1 was as skinny as a rake, and took my, hey I'm cool, you can smoke whatever in the big shed if you want to mean, hey, why don't you and all your mates spend every night in the shed blasting Metallica through tiny speakers, leaving bongs everywhere and using my jars of nuts and nails as target practice. Housemate 2 seemed like a better candidate. He was unmarried, morbidly obese and between jobs, but was a qualified former chemical engineer with no pets. Only he wasn't. Firstly, the day before he moved in he admitted that he had a Maltese Terrier, and had intentionally not mentioned it, because he hadn't been able to find a place that would let him have a pet. I hate yappy dogs, but to its credit, it was pretty chill. Later I discovered that qualified chemical engineer is code for I once worked at a paint factory. Then he started bringing very young boys into his room at random hours who he introduced as his nephews, even though they very clearly were not. As if that wasn't disturbing enough, they actively avoided me, and did not look or talk to anyone else in the house, as if they had been instructed to stay quiet. He and his dog would spend the entire day sleeping in his room. As in, he may emerge once or twice a day to use the bathroom or kitchen, but that was it. The dog had a bowl which he kept full of food at all times which brought in mice from outside. I asked him to feed his dog by putting food in it once a day, and he informed me that wouldn't be possible as the dog likes to snack. I told him that the mice had to go, and if that meant his dog had to go, then so be it. He took the bowl away. Predictably, this made him get even bigger. He must have been more than 200 kilograms by this stage. But it wasn't caused by him sleeping all day. He blamed it on the chemicals at the paint factory he once worked at. In fact, he was trying to get a disability pension, so he wouldn't have to work again. Eventually the arguments between Metallica housemate and Lazy housemate over the late night music got to the point where Lazy housemate took out an AVO against Metallica housemate, because he threatened to stab his dog when he shouted at him to turn the music down. I decided the drama wasn't worth 2 by $100 per week, so I kicked them both out. A dear friend of mine who has since passed away hired a gardener through Craigslist. The gardener robbed him when my friend went to a different state for a wedding, and kidnapped my friend's roommate. Gardener stole his car, drove his stuff and the roommate to another state dropped it off with the gardener's brothers where the roommate was held hostage for a day. The stuff including plasma TV was fenced during this time. My friend gets home from his wedding and his garage door is open, other car is gone, and no one in sight. 
He walks inside to find his two dogs locked in a closet having eaten pillows for food. They needed surgery later. He calls the cops. Later that evening the roommate calls my friend for a pay phone. He was released by the brothers after all the stuff was fenced. But the gardener took the car and led police on a high speed chase. The gardener spent some time in jail and sent my friend a Christmas card that year, apologizing. This story is completely true, and if anyone wants more deets I can answer questions. It was told to me by my friend, I miss him very much at a restaurant in what I consider to be the greatest story ever told to me. It came up because one guy at the table was talking about how great Craigslist is, and my friend said, well actually let me tell you a story. In a really bad place of my life, meet a girl off Craigslist dated. Whole thing turned south pretty fast. But being in a really bad place in my life, ignored all the warning signs. Broke contacted, moved away moved on with my life. Couple month later she sent me a text saying, I know what you did, that's a felony the cops will come after you. Now being afraid this woman I called her and said WTF. Apparently, someone posted a video of her onto one of those revenge porn sites. I told her I never did it, and I'm happy now and don't want to be dragged down by her because, I was happy now. Hung up and thought nothing of it. Fast forward two weeks, and she sent me a long text message, that she was the one that posted it there, and was hoping it would be the attention she needed to bring me back into her life. That's when I changed my phone number. Depression and Craigslist dating do not mix. Was looking for roommate somehow this person thought I was a girl. Kept sending d pics, and I kept texting I am a dude. He was like sure girl. The things I would do blah blah. Finally I had enough told this guy come to my house. Idiot shows up with flowers, I come out and tell look him a dude not a chick. He tells me tease throws the flowers on the ground. I sat there just shocked. Guy sends me a text a week later wish you would have been a girl with all that teasing. I was about 15 and had $115 from saving and Xmas money. I was looking through listings for guitars, and someone had posted a square Telecaster for $100. I text the number, saying I'm interested. Guy says he still has it, but wants $120 for it. I respond saying $110 is as high as I want to go. He says $120 or nothing. I respond saying that if that was the price amount. He then proceeded to text me for 3 days calling me an asshole and a piece of shit for not buying a guitar from him, and how good of a deal it was. Saturday rolled around, and the text had stopped, but around 11 pm, I started getting calls. He was drunk and still mad. At that point I blocked his number. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.